March Madness is here. So are we, the Three Man Weave. It is our college basketball podcast. Our annual March Madness Marathon is here. I'm Jim Root, your host this week, joined by Kai McEwen and Matthew Cox. This is our favorite episode every single season. We dive into all 30, well, 32 first round games. I guess we'll also talk the first four. So in a way, we will get to 36 games discussed on this episode talk about a little bit of region breakdowns picks for for going down the line into the final four and elite eight but really this is in its in its heart in its soul about breaking down game by game we're excited to do that for you before we do matthew how are we feeling today are you ready to put on your analysis cap yeah it's been uh it's been on i have uh, analysis cap hat hair jim i've learned it so freaking much lately you know kai um, and your trim, speaking of, looks very fresh and, and show ready. Uh, yeah. Big two weeks for us uh, looming down the <clears> pipeline here. Yeah, Jim, ready to talk games. Uh, just an opening disclaimer for this podcast. Everything we say means absolutely nothing. <clears throat> All that really matters is does the team you like or the team you bet on and the team you think will go far in your bracket, do they make shots? And does the other team not make shots? <clears throat> That's it. That's all this variance-ridden thing. Sure. To. All that said, everything we will say will inform you and be useful in your bracket or betting endeavors Kai. we hope so yeah i'm excited man best episode of the year jim we know it's gonna go pretty long that's that's the point people are listening to this on their on the airplane to vegas maybe or wherever yeah. else they're going to watch the games i love it yeah enjoy enjoy quick what's your what's your uh playing cocktail uh whiskey water oh wow very yeah. healthy mine's tequila oj matt what do you do yeah, just whiskey rocks, Kai. Okay. Oh, wow. Oh. You they, usually don't, they usually don't give it. I think you have to. Well, hair on the chest. Yeah. yeah you have to do uh, ice something, or something in there. Yeah. Something. Right. Yeah. Cool. You guys are adults. I am still a child. That's why I get tequila. It's like it's too juice. stiff or yeah. something. Yeah. To, I don't get that. Right. Okay. okay. That well, that's, that's it. I just wanted to get a quick peek at that. Fellas, we are going straight into madness previews this week. <clears> we are not doing reviews. We are not doing Roots Roundup. There's no news or notes worth talking about. It is about games. I know the transfer portal is popping off right now. I don't care about the transfer portal until the tournament is over. I guess uh, caveat being if my guy Dennis Gates reels in a, a big fish That's right. at Mizzou, then I'm okay with it. Then we can discuss it. But this is going to be about the games. That is what we want to focus on. Uh, quick shout out to Jay Pitty for the opening tunes. Shout out to Ty for all the production behind the scenes. He actually does a great job. Thanks. You don't know that, but he does. Yeah, he does. carries us in, in that regard. Uh, and if you want to subscribe to the YouTube channel, we are almost 2,000 subscribers. Mm -hmm. We'd love to have that. Uh, subscribe there. Subscribe on iTunes. Leave a review if you so if feel so inclined. We'll catch up on reviews next week when there is a smaller batch of games to break down. So skipping over those this week. All right, that is it, guys. I think it is time to jump into it, to get right into the games. We've got so many to discuss. But wait, Kai, that's a pump fake. we got to talk CBB Analytics first, a tremendous tool for helping break down these games. It is, Jim. CBBanalytics.com, guys. Check it out. You can get subscription uh, discount, a subscription discount with our promo code 3MW, $40 off. Perfect time to get into it right now, obviously, with March Madness uh, here. Not even on the horizon. It is here. Check out matchups for all the games, on-off numbers for each team, advanced analytics, fun little charts and graphs you can put together on the site. Uh, it really is a great tool for not only sports bettors, not only diehard college basketball fans, but also casual college basketball fans, guys that love Recording or girls that progress. love uh, numbers and getting into everything like that. I noticed Jim just hit the record button. Awesome. So we lost a, a little bit of the beginning here, but no big deal. <laughs> yeah, that's fine, Kai. Don't worry about it. I will I'll maybe record a separate intro or something yeah. and figure it out just put it in there we're gonna have all the analysis recorded that's all that matters that's all I love that matters it. we didn't say anything fun or creative it's fine thank goodness uh, we'll, we'll you hit their button now though jim I, I really appreciate that but cbb analytics go check it out cbb analytics.com yes. 3mw promo code promo 3MW. 3mw yep perfect all right let's start guys right at the top we're going clockwise order i'm going to host the east and the west regions one of these two is hosting south and midwest they're going to surprise me i'm looking forward to that but we're talking east first do bracket we'll reactions, Jim, line. just overall first? Well, I guess we could do that. I guess we could do that. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk bracket reactions, get a little take on that quick. Kai, we do love our bracketology, we so do. we both made a bracket beforehand. What were your biggest jump out takeaways from what the committee did or did not do? <clears throat> are you going to skewer them? Are you going to Are you gonna praise them? Well, I beat Jerry Palm, so that's good, Jim. We, we both beat Palm soundly. He did horribly once again. 
Uh, the worst Wait, record. He said he only got two wrong. Praising him for getting sixty-six. He got two wrong in the field, Matt. <laughs> he missed Everyone a lot. Got sixty-seven. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. He did a horrible job. <laughs> when it's your job on CBS to be the bracketologist, you shouldn't be one of the worst in the country at it. Uh, yeah. So, did the committee do a good job? Um, yes, I think Jim on fielding the sixty-eight teams. I had Oklahoma in over Virginia, but it's defensible. They had Virginia. They were consistent in terms of metrics. Excuse me, resume metrics getting you in the tournament. That's what all the Big East fans are missing. It's resume metrics to get you into the tournament in addition to your wins and all that jazz. On seeding the teams, no. New Mexico should have been higher. The Duquesne thing, absolutely insane. Duquesne got an 11 seed. Uh, that was clearly VCU's spot. And the committee said, we don't have a contingency plan. We're just going to slide Duquesne in there. Uh, absolutely crazy to me. Matt, there may be 50 people in the college basketball world that can build a better bracket than the committee. Why is there even a committee? Asks Kai. The committee to form new committees to overthrow committees needs to act and act swiftly and carry a big stick here. Yeah, I, I, it's funny that Virginia all of a sudden became America's number one enemy overnight. Just like the intense hatred, your owls too, vulgar animosity. Uh, yeah, no, but 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 people actually like FA. Like it's, it's a fun team to watch play. Like I think there's real, you know. There, there are people on their bandwagon, as empty as it feels now, I'll be honest. But Virginia, it's like only people root for Virginia are Virginia fans. Everyone else is like, I hate that team. You took Indiana State spot. You're going to make an absolute dud of an effort on the kickoff on Tuesday, and you're going to ruin all the NBA fans who think that college basketball is uh, you know, played at the Stone Age type of thing. So tough year for Virginia fans, Jim. That's my big takeaway from the bracket draw. Yeah, I mean, if you're within – five to seven years of winning a national title I, that should that's how bad should do we roll feel? off you that should roll off you yeah you, yeah you shouldn't really be worried about it but yeah even by virginia standards this is kind of a, an anemic offense that is not fun to watch whatsoever uh, but they're in there will probably be the team that surprises everybody and wins the first four game right. and then wins in the 7-10 game that is a little bit of a minor thing, Kai. The play-in games are both 10 seeds because yeah, of all the bids first we time saw ever. stolen. Yeah, team, teams got bumped up with uh, with NC State and Oregon and and uh, Duquesne. Like A lot of these teams pushing others up the bracket turned out weird. Uh, but it's funny. It's fun to look at, at it that way. Kai, who's the team that got in that shouldn't? Besides, I guess, is it Virginia or, or is it another team that you have some gripes with? Because I, I actually have one. You know, Jim, um, Michigan State's resume yeah, is out of my tournament. is get bad. Out. However, it was consistent with the committees. Actually, you know, it wasn't. It wasn't actually. Now I think about it. it. They're they're the outlier. Yeah, yep. Michigan State. You're right. They have actually have the worst resume metric in, uh, in the field out of at large teams. Forty seven and a half average. Um, you could have a strong argument that Michigan State should not have made the tournament. Now they were twenty four in the net. The net is not supposed to mean anything uh, in terms of selection. So that's supposed to not mean anything. It's supposed to help you out sorting and seeding teams, but clearly Michigan State. I, I don't like the narrative that the committee does things for narratives. Otherwise, we'd have Patino in the tournament, but it is kind of hard to ignore the Michigan State thing, Jim. It was kind of an eyesore. Yeah, it felt like they were in already, and then yes. like as bids got eaten up, it was like, wait, are they really the team that, that should drop out? Like, I think Oklahoma is the one that got squeezed, and mm -hmm. I think you could make a very strong argument that Oklahoma should be in ahead of Michigan State using all of the explanations that the committee gave. They they said Michigan State was up on the, uh, the nine line because of their Q1 wins. They have three. Oklahoma has more. Um, the committee explanations are, are the biggest joke in the world. They, they go pencils bad. down on Friday. And if you say otherwise, you're not paying attention. Uh, they do not pay attention to late conference games. And when asked about it, when pressed about it, they don't have any answers for it. Like the guy on TV, he had, he had no idea what to say, Jim, because the answer is simple. They just stopped paying attention pretty, pretty early in the game. Yep. I will say, Kai, it, you, you kind of hit on it, but mentioned it with the Patino thing. Bad year for conspiracy theorists in the tournament. There's not a lot of like this coach versus that coach in yep. the first round or like they're pitting Michigan State and Virginia against each other again in a rematch. They're, they're always trying to stack up the narratives. The first four games are like arguably boring and not super big yeah, they're, they're draws in terrible. terms of teams. So clearly they're not trying to set up something there to build ratings on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, yeah, Matt, I, I, I said it, but tough year for conspiracy theorists. Yeah, games are horrible in the uh, in the playing round. I mean, there are some narratives we'll get to like in the later round potential setups, but like largely, if you're gonna do a shitty job at picking the field, do a shitty job in an intriguing, fun way. Don't go over two in those two departments. That's what's you know, that's what I'm kind of bummed out. You know, kind of funny. Um, 
microcosm of the Indiana State versus Michigan State stories. Had that game been played at Indiana State, what may have happened? Who would have won? Who would be dancing? Mm -hmm. Just kind of an emblematic of the whole mid-major versus power six. Q1 skewed toward home opportunities for mid-majors, not so much. Michigan State beat these teams away from home. Maryland, Michigan, Penn State, that was it. So, I mean, again, I know Big Ten's good. I know those are three pretty good wins because they're decent teams and they're on the road. But uh, a lot of home uh, home stuffing with with yeah. these uh, power conference, you know, blah teams, I guess. Jim, I don't know if you're going to get to who got screwed or whatever, uh, but it was funny hearing Kim English give an analytics speech. Uh, there's always one coach every year that makes you roll your eyes. Kim Kim English calling analytics bullshit was the funniest thing. I mean, tell me you don't understand them by by saying that. <laughs> it's just like yeah, they are like they are objective numbers. <laughs> yeah, that you didn't not get in because you didn't beat teams by fifty. Like that argument's been made about BYU and Iowa State only, who are a two and a five seed on the yeah. S curve. I know BYU got a six. Like you're not out because you didn't win by fifty. That that is not why you're not in here. It was because after Bryce Hopkins went down, you were like nine and twelve overall. Uh, it, mm -hmm. And look, it, other Big East teams got left on the outside looking in too. Uh, Did you guys Seton have Hall, the men? St. John's? No, their resume no, metrics no. weren't good enough. Yeah, the only one I put in was St. John's, Matthew, and that was all. That was me being conspiracy theory boy, and I got shot down going with that narrative. So, I do respect that the committee kept it in, and mm -hmm. in terms of uh, kept Virginia in, was consistent with resume metrics mattering. So, I I actually can get on board with that. Ty, the Mountain West seating, I think, was a very controversial topic. Mm -hmm. I'm fine with it. I, all all season, I was a little lower on the uh, on the Mountain West, partially because of the influence <laughs> of the BPI and it's valuing of teams at altitude yep. I'm, I'm honestly okay with where they ended up i was surprised that two were in the playing games but i'm i'm generally okay with it i'm actually okay too jim because it was consistent with predictive analytics all the all those teams that fell had pretty bad predictive analytics compared to the field except for new mexico who is 23rd in Kempom right now and favored over clemson in the first round they should have been like a nine i, I know they wouldn't have been in if they didn't win the tournament but which, which I don't agree with myself. Yeah, they, they maybe, yeah. Sh maybe should have been in. You have to make that adjustment. Again, this is another example of the committee not changing things at the last minute because New Mexico is way underseeded as an 11, as evidenced by their favorite over Clemson in the first round. Yep, yep. And we will talk about that matchup. Jim's on Clemson Island, just to, just to warn the folks coming up later. Um, toughest region, Matthias. I have a strong opinion on this. I'm curious if you share it. There's one. What right is answer. the tough? What is the strongest region? It's not the region of gladiators, Jim. The uh, the east, as John Rothstein calls it. Like I, I refuse to acknowledge region of gladiators. But yes, east east is east is a beast. East is by uh, yeah, far have, the best. Yeah, east is the best the best region. I think. Yeah. Yeah, you've got a stacked uh, Auburn is a top five Ken Palm team, and they're the four seed. Iowa State has the best defense in the country. Also a top five Ken Palm team there. The five seed, uh, Illinois has a top five offense and they won their conference tournament. That That's a big deal being made of this region is mm -hmm. the amount of high seeds that actually are playing the best and won their tournaments. Uh, it's just kind of down the line there. Very, very difficult draw for UConn despite being the number one overall seed. I do not envy them, Kai. I think if you said, hey, UConn, you want to trade regions with Houston? Oh, UConn yeah. would do it immediately. They would say yes. They would not even... Uh, Collect, pass go and collect their $200 to do so. Yeah, and yeah, BYU is a five seed. They moved him to a six because of the reason they can't play on Sundays. It, it's religious-based, which, by the way, they were 17th in the S-curve, closer to a four seed. We didn't make that adjustment instead? <laughs> well, you can't because that's like those are the protected ones where you okay, get to choose your enough. site, I guess. Good like, point. But... Also, just make make them a five. Give them first choice of the five. What what are we doing here? Yeah, there, there had to be a... I would think a better way of making that work with BYU's adjustment on the S curve. Uh, Kai, I, I kind of hinted at what I think is the weakest region being the South. Okay. Where do you land on that? Uh, Midwest. Midwest for me. Um, I think you have a weakish five in Gonzaga. You have a weak four in KU with their injuries. You have the weakest six by far in South Carolina. And then I think you have a vulnerable three in Creighton as well. So I think the Midwest is the weakest, Jim, but I, I accept your answer with South. Kai hates the Maui Invitational. That's the Maui, yeah, that's Maui Midwest down there. Maui Four of the top five right. seeds all played in the Maui Invitational this year. Purdue, Gonzaga, Kansas, Tennessee. We just got Creighton tagging in for Marquette. Otherwise, it's essentially identical. Matt, do you have an opinion on weakest region? I kind of thought the West, the region of drama, 
the drama queens, I'll stop call it. Doing, can you stop? <laughs> I love that. I love that Ross team, like literally names and characterizes the regions. That's amazing. It's the best thing he does among all the great things he does for our, our great game. I think the West is the weakest. The week, how the week was won, Kai, how the West was won. Backstreet like, Boys answer. Tell me why. Yeah, tell me why. The West is the um, Arizona, Alabama, Not a believer. Baylor. For, for the exception of Baylor, I think Arizona has a very clear. I mean, we'll talk about this when we get to that. Like I think their kryptonite DNA blueprint, how to beat them is is makes them a little more vulnerable to upsets as we've seen with Tommy Lloyd teams recently. Uh, I mean, Alabama's been bad. Clemson, okay, yeah, they're not even favored in their first round game as the six, and then the five seed, um, St. Mary's, who honestly is is good, but they have not played great against good teams. They've just pounded really solid and mediocre to bad teams all year, right? They beat Gonzaga that one time, but there are some holes I think in the in the top to bottom, and I mean UNC at the top, like. I mean, Hubert Davis, I mean, of the, of the yeah, one seed. The weakest one seed. The weakest one seed, right? Like seeds, right? So, yeah. West, All right. right answer. I buy it. All right, fine. That's fun that we had three different answers for weakest region, yeah. but we are unanimous on strongest region. <clears throat> Again, tough, tough for UConn, but hey, Dan Hurley wants all the smoke. He wants to beat the best to be the best. So he has every opportunity to do that. Uh, guys, let's talk first four a little bit, I guess, before we get into the... Uh, the four regions here, this might not age great because other people might not listen to it till Tuesday or Wednesday. But, Kai, on Tuesday night, we've got two low total games, rather unexciting. We got Wagner and Howard in the two of the three worst conferences that also had a Cinderella run through the conference tournament. And then we have Virginia and Colorado State for the right to take on Texas. That total is right around 120. My God, it is going to be a slog. Yeah. Give me, give me quick uh, thoughts on either of these and a winner for both. <laughs> I think Howard beats Wagner. Uh, Howard impressed me early in the season. They took Cincy to overtime at, uh, at home. It was, it was a home game for Howard. But they also competed at Georgia Tech, nearly beat Georgia Tech. So it's a Howard team that I think many thought would win the MEAC in the preseason, in addition to Norfolk State, that actually has legit talent. Uh, Seth Towns plays there. Remember him? He played for Ohio State. Um, I, I think they beat Wagner, Jim. And the Colorado State-Virginia game, I'm pretty torn. I'm kind of just going with a gut feel on Virginia. Uh, I, I just think their defense is going to show up, and we, we, we know that's a that's a carryover to every single game they play. The offense not always there. The defense we know will be there. I'll take my chance with the Colorado State shooting over the pack line, which they have not been a good shooting team all season. Matt, your thoughts? I mean, don't pick Virginia, people. You're going to be the, the guy who gets laughed at and pointed at at the bar with your friends or relatives because they were – Everyone warned you they were the most frustrating and most anemic offensive team. And then when they show up and play like that for 40 minutes, you'll be you'll be kicking yourself. Their defense is very real. That's why they're here. It's the only reason they're here, to be honest. Um, and Jim, the Rams recent defensive had they had they made the right of improvement? They, they were good to start and then they weren't good. They had some injuries, and I think they got better late. That's kind of why I trusted this team to make maybe a second weekend run, because they at least had a defensive backbone which they hadn't had the last couple years under Nico Medved. So I think they have enough defense and enough shot making. Isaiah Stevens, um, high difficulty shot maker in a low, low, low game. Uh, give me the Rams. Don't take the who's folks. I'm sorry. Just not the year to do it. I'll, do I'll it. take the who's Matt and I'll, I'll do the, I'm the <sighs> family member laughing at you at the bar for picking a mountain West team. Last year I was at the uh, bar with Nevada mm. ticket against Arizona state. I that. could have taken Bobby Hurley instead. And I was getting punked by 25 within the first five minutes of that game. Uh, so I'm going to go with Virginia. It's going to be ugly, but uh, both those teams run very like intricate motion type stuff offensively. The, the, the difference maker probably is that Isaiah Stevens is the best ISO guy late in the shot clock, but uh, I'm still going with Virginia. I think that defense is mega stout and no one believes in us. No one believes in us, Cavs. Come on. I'm with Kai. Howard wins. They're going to be able to shoot over the top of a uh, zone. A ton of injuries in the Howard Wagner game. Like both teams are missing two to three starters that they would like to have. Wagner's down to seven guys. I don't know if an, either of the Howard guys that missed the MIAC tournament are going to come back. Shy Odom being the most notable there. Dom Campbell also. But, you know, I'm not sure how much it matters for the right to lose in the second round, like into North Carolina. Uh, okay, Matthew, the other night, Colorado and Boise is the nightcap, the fun one. We'll be already in Vegas watching that one. Oh, it's so close. It's so far away. And then Montana State, after their run through the big sky, taking on Dante Jackson and Grambling. Break these two down for me, Matthias. I like Colorado quite a bit here. It, it's a team that has not been a full 
compilation of its parts all season. Ted Boyle has basically like scrapped practicing half the time because they don't have enough guys to scrimmage. Sick injuries, you name it, both to their star players and their death pieces too. I think that's where the injury impact that's kind of flown on the radar, both for Colorado and Pac-12 brother and Oregon Kai, which we'll discuss later. Just a very deep set of injuries that's kind of torpedoed their consistency. They're the closest to healthy they've been in a while, and I think it's Boise who is overly execution-based and just honestly lacks the dudes on the wing and at the guard spot to compete with what Colorado brings to to bear. I think the the Buffs, um, the, the, their current form of health, their current bill of health with the talent they have, I just think that's the edge here. I don't give – I'm not giving the uh, Leon Rice premium bump I probably should here, but but I, I'm just going to trust the talent. Jimmy's and Joe's over X's and O's. I don't think you need to give a premium bump for Leon Rice. He hasn't really done anything in the tournament. Ever, he's ever. a mad term, but I think he's a good coach. I think we agree he's, he's a good, good coach. Co- I'm not sure I believe his tournament shortcomings are a reflection. Like Rick Barnes, I'm like, eh. But Leon Rice, I just think that's just bad variance. I, I really do. I think Colorado was a Mountain West thing, as Jim has talked about. Yeah, I think Colorado is a great matchup for for um, a Boise State, personally. Uh, Grambling. I like Grambling, the other matchup, Jim. They, they defend what Montana State does best, and that's shooting. Grambling's a great spot up three point defense this season. They also defend the post well. So when Montana State goes to Brandon Walker, Jonathan Aku is a one-man wrecking machine for Grambling inside. Um, offensively, Grambling's weakest spot by far is defensive rebounding. Montana does not offensive rebound. That's not their game. They can't take advantage of their weaknesses. Grambling, very athletic, scrappy, top five non-conference schedule. They're not scared of this game, man. It's the first tournament ever. They don't care. I, I like Grambling here. Yeah, I'm a little spooked by how hot Montana State was. I watched mm-hmm. the wrong moments of their game oh, me too. the Big Sky tournament. It's like, oh, this team's <laughs> invincible. Why would I ever bet against them? But uh, the Big Sky is typically terrible in the NCAA tournament. Maybe that matters more against a playing up competition rather than a swack team in a play-in game. I'm still TBD on that game. Likely will pick Montana State. But I'm with you, Kaya, <laughs> actually both of you guys on, on Colorado. I think the talent overwhelms. I do think Leon Rice is a good coach, but so is Ted Boyle. He's not like some yeah. slub that can't put together a game plan. Uh, I don't love that Colorado can't take advantage of Boise's lack of point guard. Like they're not going to pressure. They're not going to try to turn you over and get going in transition, but it just feels like a little bit of a talent overwhelming uh, given the full health status with Cody Williams back in their lottery pick. KJ Simpson's incredible star turn. I kept waiting for his shooting percentage just to come down. Yeah. And nope. He remains in the clouds flying close to the sun. Top 10 Kim Palm player of the year right now, Jim, KJ Simpson. He's a star. He's a star. The buffs. The buffs for me there. Boy, they could give Florida a tough game. I agree. All hey, right, over uh, a quick uh, Matty Cox props master, uh, sort of an oh. alter ego. I'm going to pilot for this episode. John okay. Olmstead, Johnny Olmstead, over under five alley oops in this <laughs> game. Whatever his points or rebounds prop <laughs> is, I think he will absolutely dominate against this front line. Just oops for days. The mustache maniac. You think he'll dominate Colorado's front line? No, no, I'm saying it gets grambling, and then oh, Olmstead on, on oh Montana State. Oh, yeah, I just, Olmstead, yeah, yeah. John, thank you, man. Transfer, who's been awesome? Aku six eleven, yeah, awesome shot Texas blocker. A&M transfer on on Grambling's front line. He's a fantastic defender. Yeah, John Olmstead's awesome. You seen him play like the last three games? He's been like the most the best player in that conference tournament by far. He was great. He's gonna be soaring. Okay, agree, disagree. Rim Robert Rattlers. Ford was the best player on that floor. Ever, Robert ever Ford was the best yeah, player. him and Eddie Turner were awesome. <laughs> Honestly, Montana State's kind of good. Those guards are really disruptive, and they're just lightning fast. They're not bad at all, yeah. man. Not bad at all. They're favored. Yeah. All right. Let's get into a region here, fellas. Let's start talking games individually here. We're going to the East first. We all dis- agreed that it was the toughest region, as announced by the committee. Got the number one overall seed, UConn, taking on Stetson in the 116 game. Kai, I thought Stetson could be kind of feisty given their lethal backcourt, and they do have two 6'11 dudes they can rotate at center if they mm-hmm. want to eat fouls. They got shooting with, uh, with Oglesby on the wing. But it's UConn. They they pretty much pick their number when they're playing yeah. inferior competition. If they want to win this game by 40, they probably can, right? I hate that they drew UConn. Yeah, I'm intrigued by a first to 15 bet. I know it's not the betting show, but that, that's tomorrow. But Stetson can shoot. And they have terrific guards. Steven Swenson, Jalen Blackman are legitimate guards. They're, they're not just a sun guards. They are very, very good uh, guards when you think of the whole country landscape. However, UConn is going to score at will. This is the number one offense in the country against the number 342 defense in the country. It's a bloodbath in the boards, Matt. Top 15 offensive rebounding team versus number 300 in defensive rebounding. I love Gatoretze, Stetson's center. He has no chance against Klingon. If Stetson can get hot, which they can, Matt, I think they can be a pest for maybe a half. But ultimately, I think UConn kind of cruises, and, and there's no worry of a 16-1 upset here. 
Yeah, our Hatters, Kai, our Hatters played Cincy close, I remember, at the end of December, like a big physical team, um, but not, not UConn, obviously, right? Just a different beast. I, the zone maybe gives UConn a problem for like a half, but then after that, no. Yeah, no, I I think maybe the shot making of Blackman and Swenson and Oglesby could keep it a little close, but yeah, again, I just, it's kind of up to UConn what they want to do with this game. They will win. They could win by a lot going away. It, it was like, oh, Stetson actually has a couple seven footers to compete inside, but they're both giving up 65 pounds to Donovan Klingon. They're twigs. So yes. uh, it, it is frightening what could happen in the paint. Yeah. Trey Thompson's really bad. He's horrible. He's really bad. <laughs> wow. I, I can't believe he was at Minnesota. <laughs> yeah, Gedaritz is uh, good. Man. Not Trey Thompson. No. All right. I'm glad I'm glad we agree there, Kai. That is a, <laughs> that is a unanimous opinion. Jim, why are you talking shit on John Olmstead? In the chat, I just now see this. What 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 he should be for John? He had six combined points in the first two games of that tournament. He, he wasn't the best yeah, player in the yeah, tournament. Yeah, the Jim Jim there allowed six though, and he had fifteen. And he was dominant in their games. You, you saw that, his best game of the season, Matt, and you're projecting a little too much. No, actually, I've seen just... two. I saw the Weber State game too. He was awesome in that game. So I have seen two of his best games of his entire basketball career. Yeah, I, I like he's hurt or something like that. I like it. He's, um, a, he's a down transfer to Ted's point. Arizona State. This yeah. doesn't need to be a John Olmstead podcast, <laughs> fellas. We got a lot of games to discuss. Uh, we're Anyone going to FAU Northwestern, Matt, a game I know you will have opinions on. Your Owls, Dusty May and the boys did make it back in the tournament. Semi-controversial seating after they swooned a little late. Dropped one to the other Owls, but they're a very deep backcourt against a banged-up backcourt. My one concern, Matthias, the, the kind of swing four-man that has given them a lot of problems, Brooks Barnheiser has been a monster lately in that mid-post area. Can he do to FAU what Marcus Damask did to them? Uh, no, Marcus Damascus is a different type of that's those aren't comparable <laughs> prototypes, in my opinion. Um, I, I'm worried about Matthew Nicholson. Like, is he is he out for this tournament? If he is like, that's huge. I mean, I think Golden could completely own the rim. Like, that's been the steadying force of FAU all year while they've been up and down. And do <laughs> they care? Do they not care? Why is their defense? So, I mean, Golden's been a monster at the rim each and every night when he's played big minutes, stayed out of foul trouble. That's their edge to an advantage here, Kai. Boo Booey always concerns me as does the Dusty May flight tracker to, what is that, Louisville? I think I've saw today <laughs> on the on the Twitter sphere. Eh, I, I still see this is more as a, a last dance situation for FAU. I think they're going to make a deep run. So. Like, like I said, FAU has gone from national darling to the most hated team in America. I, I saw so much discourse that they should be out. Way too much focus on the Temple loss. They beat Butler A&M, Virginia Tech, neutral floor. They beat Arizona, neutral floor. They were up in the second half against Illinois on a neutral floor. This team's good, man. And it, I, I think you're a fool if you don't think they belong in this tournament. Most of these guys played last year in the Final Four. Northwestern's no pushover. This is actually a pretty tough matchup for them. I think Northwestern's a good tournament team. They have that moxie. Yep. But it's not yep. the same, like, pesty defensive team Northwestern usually has the last couple of years under Collins. It's, it's more offensive stilted. They, they're not great on defense. Boo is awesome. They don't make mistakes. Both experienced teams. But, Jim, I just love the cohesion of FAU. They know what it takes to win. They've been here before. And something tells me they kind of turn things on, turn the the afterburners on in the tournament. Yeah, I think both teams can score here. Like Bowie's going to probably put up twenty five. Like he's just too good of a scorer not to. He he loves a big moment. He's terrific down the stretch of games. FAU needs to make sure this isn't like a one point game late because they've had some bad late game possessions, namely yeah, the have. not getting a shot off against Temple uh, in the final possession there. And you know Northwestern's going to get, whether it's a boo-booey step back or whatever, he's good enough to score on any possession against anyone. So I, FAU needs to extend and not lead this up to chance in the final minute. I do think they can, though. I think they can overwhelm with talent. Matt's point about Nicholson is spot on. FAU can actually dominate the rim. And Matt, we do like that they're experimenting with two bigs, with, with Brendan Lorient as the four-man, giving them a little bit more of an optimal defensive yep. lineup at times, at least an option to pivot to. Yeah, I feel pretty confident real quick. This game will be like within eight points the a whole way. I Northwestern very cockroachy. It's kind of how they've evolved with less depth and more defensive minded late just lately. Um and FAU, we know, cannot build and hold leads. Like they've consistently let teams come back. Um, I just think their defense lets up when they get like three, four possession advantages. They just don't quite dial in and extend when they need to. Yeah, just don't get down early like you did in every AAC game where you're down 10, <laughs> right. 12 points. That I, I would not recommend that against Northwestern's patience and shot making. All right, next up, UAB and San Diego State in the 5-12 matchup here. I don't know why I said the 12 first. I'm a weirdo. Uh, San Diego State tie a very similar spot in the bracket here. 
five seed in the top left bracket. They made a, a run to the final four from this exact spot last year. The Aztecs, not quite the same team as last year, but they have a star up front in Jaden Ledee taking on a, a UAB team that's playing very well. How do you see this one? Yeah, uh, another elite defense for San Diego State. Ho hum. Number nine in the country, third straight year in the top 10. Four of the last five years, they've been in the top 10 as well. UAB, though, this team obviously didn't play very well for most of the year, but they're hitting it now. In preseason, they were 90th in Kempom. We thought they'd be pretty good this year. They got it to 175 in Kempom. Again, they went through that lull. Now back to 106. This team has talent. Eric Gaines can be one of those game-breaking guards that, that you always talk about in March. I think they can find points in this game. They can get to the line. They can compete on the glass with San Diego State. I'm not sure, Matt, your boy Yaxo Lindeborg can guard the D. I, I, I have my doubts. Oh, and he's, be, oh, he's, he's been a bit of a sieve inside. No offense to Yaxel. Um, but, man, I, I think San Diego State's kind of like FAU, man. A lot of these guys were in the title game last year. They know what it takes to win. I, I lean towards San Diego State. Well, this is just a bracket show. I'm, I'm picking San Diego State over UAB. I, I think UAB's pedestrian, like, interior defensive numbers, I think you're sort of alluding to there, Kai, are, are mostly baked in their mental lapses that were mostly earlier in the season. I think now they're just guarding really well. Like, I think Kennedy's kind of figured out their defense and weaponized their athletes. They're not doing like stupid boneheaded things that we saw them do early in the year. I called it Diet Memphis on our show last night. I think that kind of stands. They just, w when they're locked in, they're focused and they they don't have these mental lapses, they are really good. Like they have a ton of talent, athletes galore, size galore. Like San Diego State will not feel like the bigger, more physical team here. Like, I think that'll be a wash just in terms of the get off the bus test. Um, and I've just been kind of an Aztec seller all season. I think people have figured out ways to defend with the inside. I think this is a close game. Have they? Very, very uh, yeah, close. I think I think UAB wins. Um, I'm not sure I totally agree with Matt's point that they've figured out Ladi. I don't think averaging like 20 and 13. Oh, he's been a monster, but 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 they <laughs> they they started to look more mortal in in Mountain West play when I think teams started to double him and find new ways to because he's such a like he is the entire offense for them right now. Like they don't have a lot of balance on the outside. Yeah, no, and that, that's what concerns it, me. But... You don't have like the guard playmakers and Eric Gaines is cooking lately. I believe in his last five games, he has 32, uh, 33 assists, seven turnovers, and 20 steals. His 20 steals and seven turnovers. Like, he literally has created 13 more possessions than he has given up, despite being the primary ball handler. Butta Johnson's a scorer, big-time, big-time scorer Butta. on the wing. Uh, and, they've, yeah, they've got the physicality to fight in the paint. Both teams are going to probably dominate the offensive glass. Neither team is great on the defensive boards, but uh, both will get second-chance points. Uh -huh. That's my Twitter handle. Uh -huh. up. Uh, but I, I think UAB wins. I think this is one uh, it sets up well for them, a team that's rising and has a lot of talent that just kind of underperformed for part of the year. Sad that you guys forget about Lamont Butler and Darian Trammell. My God. They're fine. They're fine. They're, They're fine. fine. They're Thank you, Jim. Thank they you, were Jim. heroes last year in the dance. They've done it before. They do yeah, it again. No, they were villains. Yeah. They ruined they our miss, heroes. They miss protagonist Fatty story. Daddy, Matty Bradley. Taking they do. Care they they yeah, 100% do miss Fatty Daddy, Matty Bradley. Mensa. Oh, yeah, they miss a lot. Uh, all right, so we'll split some some split opinions there. All right, Auburn, Yale. I, I saw somebody in the chat saying potentially I think uh, Yale could nip Auburn. I say no chance, Matt. I think Yale is a very rim reliant offense, and they have no chance of scoring at the rim against this Auburn team. Perhaps Pulakitis and Mahoney hit some shots from the perimeter, and M Bang is is pretty solid in the mid range. But I think Danny Wolfson for a, a world of hurt in this matchup. Matt Noling is going to get outclassed athletically. I actually like Auburn a decent amount here, Matt, um, winning by 15 or so. I do too. People were saying like, oh, Yale, so smart. They take care of the ball. And like, <laughs> I know the numbers portray them as very good ball handlers, but they don't see any pressure like all year. So they play in the Ivy. It's kind of why I think Cornell has been so effective because they've kind of posed it up to a very unique style that has caught teams off guards. And we saw Yale in a couple of those Cornell games, like not, not very, very comfortable against Cornell's pressure. Now, how's it going to look when Auburn athletes are coming at you? That's my concern. I think you're looking at a team that they are athletic. Unlike most Ivy teams, they actually can, they're not going to be overwhelmed by what Auburn brings in terms of speed, size, all that stuff. But I do worry that their perceived ball possession intelligence is not as great and will be exposed by Auburn, Kai. Yeah, it's a great point. Uh, I, I totally agree, Matt. Uh, by the way, Auburn setting the scene here. Second year in a row, the committee has seated a top five Kempom team at a four seed. It was UConn last year. It's Auburn this year. Um, I love Yale. I just don't think they compete here. Two games this year against power teams. Lost by 15 at KU. Lost by 15 at Gonzaga. Not bad results by any means, but I don't think they can 
face, this, to- this sort of athleticism. The discrepancy is way too too large in the athleticism column. The Oregon rebounding team, like Matt said, they handle the rock. That That's two keys. But again, it's a different kind of pressure. It's a different kind of rebounding team in Auburn. How will, Na- how will Yale score against the nation's best two-point field goal percentage defense? I, I don't think they can. And Auburn and Spaceman on the run transition, they take care of business here. So I like Auburn. Yeah, Kai, to your point, too, no, it was two years ago, Houston was a five seed as a top five Ken Palm team. So yeah. uh, it's tough. It's tough for the one seed when you end up having to deal with that. That was Illinois that year, and, and they, or they were the four seed and got kind of screwed. Uh, circling back to Matt's point about Yale not playing pressure, if you look at the opponent tracker on Ken Palm, they've played three teams in the top 100 of defensive turnover rate. Cornell was three of them. Fairfield is the only wow. one in the top 75 of defensive turnover rate, and they lost to Fairfield, blowing a lead late by turning the ball over. Uh, that concerns me. It sounds like a, a real potential issue for them. And Beng's a great Points. point guard, but like Pulikitas Mahoney are more shooters. They're, they're not really going to be right. bringing the ball up against pressure. Nolan can sort of handle it. But yeah, the size, the athleticism, the confidence that Auburn plays with. I think they're going to be fine here. It's not going to be like a couple of years back when the Final Four team almost lost in the first round to New Mexico State. Uh, yeah, I, I think we were on New Mexico State, I believe, Jim. We I was were, just thinking of that game. Was. <laughs> and then also the Yale LSU game 2019. Um, you know, Mia One almost, almost clipped LSU, right? Another athletic SEC team. Now, I think different DNAs there. Auburn has more rim protection. LSU, that team was a little more just like frenetic, but. Um, and Mia Oni yeah. was an NBA player, like second round draft right. pick. No one on Yale, Yale I guess happen. Danny Wolf, people think could play in the. Uh, I don't know. We'll yeah, I just I fear him against Jani Broom and different Jill player. Well, and, <laughs> different yeah, player. That's that's a tough, tough matchup for him. Okay, so the bottom half of the bracket: BYU and Duquesne. Matt, help me solve this because BYU is such a high variance outcome team because they take a bajillion threes. They play in transition. That does help them getting more more possessions here uh, against a, a very stout half court defense under the retiring Keith Dambrot. Um, where do you land on the Cougars versus the Dukes? I'm taking the Dukes. I'm just going to ride the Keith Dambrot story. To be honest, I, I don't love that BYU gets like so little at the rim. I saw the shot quality um, and CBB analytics shot charts. Just not a lot of easy buckets inside of BYU, and they have good post players but they're almost always throwing it inside to get it back outside for threes. They're always trying to run to get threes. They kill you with the simple math of three is more than two. But if you live and die with that approach as a favor, especially it seems like Duquesne guy who can at least not slow it down, but keep it at a moderate pace. We're not getting to like the nineties, good defensive team, athletic. I don't know. I think BYU could be in a little bit of a, a, a nail, nail biter here late. Yeah. I mean, you have a team in BYU that should be a five. It was a five per the committee. You have a team in Duquesne that is not an 11, should have been a 12, maybe even a 13. I think BYU blasts them. I've already taken this game against the spread. Again, not a betting show, but the Dukes haven't seen an offense like this all season. All season. This is by far the best offensive team they've played. BYU has too many weapons, man. Duquesne's offense is atrocious. They take horrible shots. They're careless with the ball. I think BYU wins by double digits. Yeah, Kai, the only other top 25 offense that Duquesne has played is Dayton three times. They lost by 13, uh, excuse me, 10, 16, and then one by eight in one of the games. That was the tournament game yep. that they just saw recently. But we know that Dayton's not the same as they've been right now. Think about how good BYU's offense, right? And non-con, I'm like, they're blowing teams out. Yeah, yeah and what makes them, it's so hard to guard with Khalifa pulling you away, your bigs away from the rim. It's just so it's, unique. It is, yeah. First time saying it, it's going to be tough. That that's what I worry about. I mean, how many non-conference teams do we need to see them absolutely smoke? And I know that was at altitude, and they had that advantage. But like decent teams would go to uh, would go to Salt Lake or to Provo, excuse me, and just get absolutely smashed. So it just comes down to shooting. If they go five for thirty-two from three, yes, Duquesne will absolutely hang around. But they get such great shots from the perimeter, and they have really good shooters. I'm going to believe that they knock them down this first round game and, and take care of business. So BYU. For old Jimbo. Illinois and Moorhead State now, fellas. Battle in the Midwest. Preston Spradlin, rising coaching star on the sideline for the Eagles. But Matt, Illinois has one of the best transition offenses in the country. They are scary when Terrence Shannon gets going. And even in the half court, they've got a lot of weapons. Dane Danger had a great Big Ten tournament kind of emerging after getting buried for a little bit of time. So they can go in any different direction from a lineup perspective. Does Moorhead State have a chance of pulling off the upset? 
Mm, no, I don't think so. I um, no, they're healthier now. They're their only blemish in their schedule is when they lost three games in a row and they weren't healthy. Like they've been pretty dang good. Now you look at their non-conference. They didn't play good teams very often. They played Indiana. Indiana fans remember that game very well. Um, probably should have lost that game as a Hoosier fan. Got pretty much dominated by Penn State. Purdue controlled them. Alabama controlled them. But those were early in the year. So I don't want to like look at those and be like, ah, they can't step up. However, I do believe that they're going to be outclassed in this game. Um, just with the size and the speed and talent that Illinois has, Kai. Um, Riley Minix up front. Stuck. Huge piece. Coleman Hawkins, though, is a pretty good matchup, right? Like an agile, long, talented, yeah, okay. big guy that can guard him. Maybe. You know? Maybe the Minix isn't like a true big. He's a wing. I mean, he he's weird. He right? plays yeah, everywhere. He's just different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last time Moorhead was in the dance, uh, kind of similar situation. 14 seed, lost by 17 to West Virginia. They've played four Power Six opponents this year: Alabama lost by 32, Purdue lost by 30, Penn State lost by 23, Indiana by one. They hung with Matt's Hoosiers. Hey, congratulations! Way to go. They have a ton of size, way more than a usual mid major. Can they put up a fight against the strong Illini drives? Maybe with that sort of size. But can they score? They do shoot a ton of threes, Jim. So maybe it's high variance. We know Riley Minix, like Matt mentioned, star. I don't think Illinois will take advantage of Moorhead's sub- suspect ball handling. That's definitely a weakness Moorhead has that Illinois can't really exploit. I'll say I'm intrigued by this game just because of the size, but I don't like that record against power opponents this year. Yeah, it's not awesome. I, I mean, the fact that Illinois is not going to take advantage of their ball handling is is good. Like that, that, they're a little bit shaky in that department. They can turn it over, but Illinois does not force turnovers. They're bottom five in the country in defensive turnover rate. That that is helpful. I get a little bit of vibes of the Chattanooga game from a couple of years ago. It was a five versus twelve rather than a three versus fourteen, but uh, well coached underdog that's going to slow it down and has a lot of experience slowing it down. More had had to do that. All OVC season, it's a very, very up-tempo league, and they're like the one team that tries to crawl and beat you in the half court. It's just against a much different talent level. That's the that's obviously the concern here. Illinois is going to get out and run sometimes. It's just a matter of can Moorhead limit that, and can they hit threes like I mentioned? Khalil Thomas, Drew Thalwell, Jordan Lathan, Minix uh, being the big you know matchup problem. We'll see if they can deal with him, but I think they keep it close. I, I think they hang around. I like Moorhead. Yeah. Yeah, okay. There we go. Wait, let's clip that. Jim likes more head. <laughs> well, that's fine. I we're certainly mid, like it more. We're mid-30s. I, pref- I, prefer, I prefer it to less head, Kai. Yeah, How about that? Me too. Me too. Me All too. right, now, Washington State and Drake, two darlings of the Weed Podcast. I would say Matt yeah. has been a data raid acolyte for years and years and years. We love watching Drake. Kai and I saw them up close and personal at Indiana State this year. A treat. A true coin flip type of game, Kai, in the 7-10 matchup. Who's going to get the edge and why? We hate when teams we like match up with each other in the first round, don't we? Man. Yeah, two well-coached teams. Tell you what, man, Drake's damn good. Uh, I don't I don't want to say don't get it twisted because I hate that saying, but don't get it twisted. This team is good. Beat Nevada by 19 on neutral. They can score. Excellent shooters. DeVries will have four shooters on the floor at all times. His son, Tucker DeVries, is a pro. Dude's a stud. Uh, they're experienced. They have size. They're also, get this, Matt, all caps, the best defensive rebounding team in the country. This matters against a, a Wazoo team that's big, that's used to having size advantages over, over teams and kind of bowling them over. And I think Drake has a ton of options to throw at Rice. Miles Rice, Wazoo's best player, fantastic guard. I'm going Drake in this game. Yeah, I think Drake's defense is very underrated. I think uh, on the year, they're better offensively than defensively. I, I trying to get the BART updated. But they're good on both shot. ends, right? Like They're they're good. really balanced. Yeah. And from what I've seen lately, like they've been better defensively um, because that's sort of, I think, how they profile well in this tournament. They can play well as a dog you know, against a team with maybe more talent, a little more size because of how they shell like defend, how they control the glass. And yeah, you have a pro in, tra- in Tucker DeVries, right? He can make tough shots over tough defenders, kind of the ultra, you know, neutralizing factor. Um, but Jim, are we sure that he's the best player on the floor in this game? Like, are we sleeping on how good Miles Rice and Jalen Wells have been for the Cougars? Tucker DeVries is the best player. Tucker DeVries is the best, is the best okay. player. Yeah, the, the, no, I think I agree. I just I think it's worth a – let's stop and pause and make sure that we're right about that. I think that's fair, though. Okay, all right. Well, I Drake is one of these teams like Creighton, Purdue, St. Mary's, like heavy drop coverage, pick and roll. Like, they want uh, Big Brody to just sit in the lane, contest things. He's not a shot blocker, but he's huge. And he's going to bother you if you get all the way to the rim. And then they've got a bunch of little nap type on ball defenders with right and end right. 
and and even Overton and Garland, they're just going to bug Miles Rice, get inside him, get underneath him, make him, you know, have to hit pull-up jumpers, tough contested type stuff with guys chasing him from behind. They're not going to give up spot-up shots. Uh, they're not going to help off shooters like that. They want to make you score either the, the ball handler or the roller in pick and roll. And I don't know, that that's not what I love with Washington State. And to Kai's point, I think they need to get second chance opportunities with their size bludgeon you and – you don't you don't get those against Drake. They're just too stout, too stout, stout or sound is what I'm trying to say. I'm combining the two words. <laughs> too many stouts uh, too, on Saturday, Jim. That's right, Kai. Too many <laughs> uh, but too many, too much of both mm, of those on the glass, and I think that's a, a matchup edge. So I do. I'm picking Drake. I'm picking Drake. I, I think I said I like Morehead last game. That was more against the spread. Illinois is going to win. Yeah, but um, yeah, Drake for me. Last in this region, Iowa State. South Dakota State, Matt, you immediately picked up on it with the coaching rematch here. Otzelberger against his old buddy Henderson, his old school up there in South Dakota State. Iowa State rolling right now. Incredible defensive pressure. That's what we know them for. They really make it hard on you. Keyshawn Gilbert, a uh, stat from my my write-up on this game. Keyshawn Gilbert and Taman Lipsy are both in the top 75 nationally in steal rate. No one in the entire Missouri Valley is in that, and I guess that's more for a Drake matchup later on. Uh, but South Dakota State, I don't think they've seen pressure like this either in the summit, quite honestly. No, I don't think they're going to respond very well to it. I, I think Iowa State wins very easily here. I, just let's all make sure we're all in the – no one's taking Iowa State that seriously, like in the long-term projection of your bracket. I want to be that person, but I know deep down we're all thinking the same thing. Like there's just some unspoken untrustworthiness with this team, probably scarred by last season. But like – the Wizard of Ots took them to a Sweet 16 with less talent two years ago. This team's been like all the way good for a while. Um, yeah, Iowa State, I think, makes a statement win here, Kai, in route to what could be a very, very deep turning run. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You guys said Osbert. Yeah. He took South Dakota, South Dakota State, excuse me, to two NCAA tournaments, 2017 and 2018. A little history, history backup here. Uh, I agree with Jim that the best defense in the country could wreak havoc on the bunny ball handlers. But. South Dakota State can shoot from everywhere. They're playing four or five guys who can shoot. That's their chance. Iowa State will, quote-unquote, allow you to shoot from the outside. South Dakota State, if they're hitting, can make it interesting. Iowa State's also not going to overwhelm South Dakota State on the other end. They have talent, but they're not an explosive offense by any means. So if somehow South Dakota State can, can take care of the ball, if Zeke Mayo steps up, the guy's the Summit League Player of the Year, I think they can hang a bit. I think Iowa State wins. Yeah, very much a compact defensive shell for South Dakota State. They mm -hmm. want to force you to shoot over the top, one of the uh, lowest-ranked three-point attempt rates, the 361st defensively. They gave up a ton of jump shots, but that's not really Iowa State's strength, so that could limit them. Matt, you're mentioning being scarred by Iowa State. It, for me, it's the the game against Texas A&M in the ESPN Invitational, where A&M was down two starters, had another one that was ill. Iowa State gets up 35-13 to 13 and then scores three points over the next 10 score. minutes. Yeah. Right. and lets Texas Sam all the way back in it and loses that game. I know they were great in the Big 12. I know they just punked Houston, like completely crushed them in that tournament final. But long term, I'm still a little skeptical. Here, no worries. This is this is what they do. They blow out these inferior teams, did it all year, and that pressure, I think, shows up against the Jack Bunnies. Guys, any region picks here? Uh, I guess we could go all the way through the bracket, maybe just a Sweet 16 Quick say and then Elite Eight. We'll break down later rounds as we get further yeah. in the tournament. But Kai, your Sweet 16 and Elite Eight Final Four types. Sure, I got my lovely printed bracket right here, Jim. Uh, so, Sweet 16, FAU over UConn. That's right. FAU, FAU, Auburn, BYU, and Drake in my Sweet 16. Auburn over Drake in the Elite Eight. Auburn is my Final Four representative in the East. Boom. Matthew, are you joining Kai and sending UConn home before the first weekend? Yeah, sorry. FAU, Auburn, um, Illinois, Iowa State, chalk on the bottom, putting my money where my mouth is, clones nation against FAU. Sorry, clones. FAU is in the Final Four. Wow, back to back for Dusty May, <laughs> says Matthias. That'd be pretty sweet. I just, I, I, ha I have awesome. to do it. I'm sorry. I just, I, I know maybe you've put a gun to my head. I'm not sure if I, uh, Defensive question marks, but no, I have to stick with that. Sorry, FAU hey, Final Four. Himulated. Butler did it. Butler did it. They went to back to back. So perhaps in the second year they did it was out of an eight nine game. So perhaps they're 
able to do it as well. Uh, I actually have UConn beating FAU. I'm the the crazy lunatic on this pod. <laughs> I think the best team in the country will make the Sweet 16. Uh, I Auburn, Illinois, Iowa State, rather chalky, but then it gets less chalky. Auburn, Illinois in the Elite Eight. I have Auburn pulling off that upset. And the fighting Brad Underwood's going to the Final Four, Salvation in Champagne. You're going to go nuts, Illini fan. You're going to have a great – we'll see you down in Phoenix. It's going to be wonderful. First since 2005 in St. Louis, Jim. Oh, yeah, that was, that, was, that was great for them. Hey, the, I believe it's State Farm building out in uh, Phoenix, and Champagne is very close to – there's a whole bunch of State Farm people in Champagne. State, Norm, State, oh, wow. State, State Farm Center, in fact. Um, there you go. Is the yeah. Illinois yeah. Stadium, yeah. A little pipeline there. It's a little yeah. State Farm pipeline. That's fun. All right. Which one of you wants to host the South region? I'm handing off the keys to you. Step up, one of you. Mm, I'm looking. I'm giving I'm Matt his, I, his I, choice. I'm giving Matt I want his the choice. West. Okay. I want the West. I want the region of drama. No, That's I'm doing Kai. So, Kai, I'm, I'm I'm doing, my point is I'm deferring Kai I'm to the I'm doing the West, of, Matthew. What? You're doing, Why? I said I'm doing the first in the last region. Whoa. We already established this at the beginning of the podcast. Matt, would you like the Midwest uh, or the South? I want the West, but I'll do the Midwest. You can do the South. So take it away, Sir King. Okay, thank you so much. I will be doing the South. Hi, hello, my name is Kai. I'm part of the Three Man Weave. Uh, let's just get right into it. There's, there's no need to, to, to pussyfoot around. Houston, Longwood, one versus sixteen matchup. Hulk smash, Hulk smash is what Kai says. Jim, Longwood in 2022. Do you remember? I do. We took Longwood against Tennessee, thinking they could compete. Nope, they lost by 32. Jim, same thing here. Yeah, I think so. I I thought of Wesley Snipes, Demolition Man. That's what I. That's what what came to Good my movie. mind here. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, Stallone. Uh, yeah, I I think Houston destroys them. I, maybe there's a route to points for Longwood via offensive glass and getting to the free throw line, but everything they did well in the Big South tournament, like out tough you, beat you to loose balls. That's they like clowned Asheville doing that. Houston is going to obliterate them in that department. I think Houston coming off a gigantic loss, embarrassing loss in the Big 12 tournament will we'll sit with them. And last year, remember, they almost lost in the first round to Northern Kentucky as a one seed. Like, it was really close. True. I don't think any of these guys take this game lightly. I, I think this is a really good spot and bad match or and good matchup for Houston. Big old win for them. Uh, Longwood's going to make Houston chuck it from the cheap seats. Hughes' reference, Kai. Here's the problem with Thanks. Longwood is... Elijah Tucker, their starting big guy, Xavier transfer, I believe, Jim, Kai, Nurse, uh, did not play in their last <laughs> game. He's pretty important against Houston, who has a couple of good guys up front. So it's you don't want to be going into a game shorthanded in your front line playing Houston. That just isn't a recipe for success. That is my primary concern. Um, if they he got, is, they in got fact, Zapala, the Utah State monster. Oh, yeah, they got him too. Okay, kind of. Why were they the worst interior defense in that conference? That does not bode well against Houston. The no, worst two point percentage yeah. defense in the Big South. Also, Longwood, good. Longwood can't shoot really. They're gonna take three. Napper is a game a game changer, but he can't shoot. Uh, Houston's gonna crush it. Even if Longwood gets to the line, they're three hundredth in free throw percentage. I don't like how strongly we're going against our guy Griff, though. I, I feel like we need to be love Griff, more. but you know who I love more Kelvin Sampson. You can't out muscle or out physical Houston. It's gonna be a wake up call of epic proportions, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean a statement. Statement went for the years. You can't look, look go to war. Yeah, I, I think I think the Tennessee game from two years ago matters a lot in terms of projecting how this team plays up. Uh, I think that's an issue. Yeah, Kyle, you mentioned Longwood shooting the 346th and three point attempt rate. Now, you you got to make shots over the top against Houston. They're mm -hmm. not going to be able to do that. Longwood impressed me. It's Dayton. That's why I'm still like thinking Longwood is a chance. I did watch that game. Dayton's not Houston. I know that, but they did play Dayton pretty close this year. I don't know. You you hate Dayton. I know what I'm saying. Like, I don't know why I'm letting Dayton influence <laughs> yeah, yeah, my. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm about to pile on the Houston train with you, and I'm like, ah, I don't know. Griff Aldridge is my guy, and Longwood yeah. was okay against love, Dayton. Love Griff. I think it's a bad matchup. Yeah, it is. All right, we move Griff on. We move on to the eight nine, where Texas A&M is playing another Big Ten team that can shoot. Oh no, Nebraska! Remember last year, Matt, when A&M played Penn State, but, 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 and we were all on Penn ball. State. Booty ball. Yep. That was fun. Penn State won by 17. The Nittany Lions shot 13 for 22 from three. You know who can fill it up? Nebraska. Casey Tominaga. Yeah, household name this season in the tournament, potentially. Uh, Houston, or excuse me, Texas A&M, Matt, 351st in three-point attempt rate allowed. No bueno against the Huskers. Your thoughts? 
uh, this is an easy one to pick in terms of just rooting interest for fun. If you want to have a fun time rooting on a team that you picked or bet on, you want to go to Nebraska here. It's just a way funner story. Tommy Young is amazing. The team's just all the way invested. The mayor, Fred Hoiberg, has mojo back. And then a and just a bunch of dudes that throw it at the rim and go get it and play volleyball. And, and I know they've been scoring more points lately, Jim, but it's just not a fun, aesthetically pleasing team. There is a recipe to success by dominating the glass, which you can do against Nebraska. Not a great rebounding team. They do take care of the ball for, despite some of their shot making suspicions, I'll say. Um, my heart's telling me Nebraska. My head's telling me a and I did actually go A&M and I hate it. I absolutely hate it. Yeah, have fun cheering for them when we're celebrating Tomonaga's 6-3 in, in the There's first There's other half. games on, I think, in the overlap of this. I was looking at the slate because this won't be on my primary TV oh. uh, viewage angle. So I, I will be ignoring this game probably. Yeah, I mean, Penn State was small last year and they held up well enough. They were a better defensive rebounding team in terms of like principles and, and rate. But I think Nebraska will will at least be focused on that. And yeah, the, the three-point shooting, man, it, should, it could be a cascade over the top. And... Nebraska's defense has been unbelievable lately. And now they're taking on a team that is 345th in the country in effective field goal percentage. They don't make shots from anywhere near the hoop mid range from three. They don't make them uh, except when Wade Taylor is like ludicrously on fire, but those are typically in their biggest games. I think if they get to the second round, Taylor has a nice game against Houston, but uh, I trust Nebraska here. Wilcher can get hot too off the bench and they're scrappy. Sammy Hoiberg's going to going to force some key turnovers. Nebraska for me, I think they they rein in 12, 15 three pointers over the top. Yeah, to, uh, and, it, it, go ahead, Matt. I was like, every bucket for AM and is like this Allen Iverson level difficulty layup from Boots or Wade Taylor at three. It's like, yeah. like he just lifted a thousand pounds to score two points. It's just hard for AM to put points on. Wade Taylor, he, scored lately. he is the best guard on the floor. That that definitely scares me. I, Wade Taylor's made for March. I'm going to say that a few times about other guys, but should mention A and M, the best offensive rebound team in the country. Nebraska, 223rd defensive rebounding team. It is an advantage. To Jim's point, though, Aggies can't shoot, man. They struggle to score from everywhere, and I agree. I think the defense for Nebraska has turned around for good. I, I'm buying it, and I'm buying a Tomanaga and company shooting a lot of threes. Yes. Since February 1st, number three in the country. I mean, that's a long sample size. That's thir- or 12 games that they've played, and they're that good. And the three-point shooting percentage is low, but it's not like 24% complete aberration. They're just really good defensively with Jawan Gary back in the lineup. Matt, your boy, yeah. you love going to bat for, for Jawan Gary. Swiss Army knife, Jawan, absolutely. All right, we're going to the 512, which is the most popular upset pick. It probably should be. JMU should probably be an 11 seed instead of Duquesne. But they're on the 12 line against Wisconsin, who almost won the Big Ten Conference Tournament title. It's sexy, but guess what, Jim? I'm going to agree. JMU beat Sparty at Sparty. Unfortunately, it is the only top 100 game JMU has played outside of App State. They lost twice to App State. JMU's old, athletic, and can shoot the crap out of the ball. Who do you got? Yeah, I like JMU. I, I think the depth, the, the multiple different weapons that they can attack Wisconsin with, and despite how great Store was in that Big Ten tournament, like, my God, he was unbelievable, they still do have a little bit of the athletic deficiencies. I think they're going to be the second most athletic team on the court in this game. Uh, JMU has that in both the backcourt and on the wing. Up front, they're not huge, but I'm not like too worried that Bickerstaff, who played in the ACC, is going to get like destroyed by Crowler Wall. I'm I'm fairly comfortable there. Wooden can stretch the floor, but also bang inside. I just kind of think JMU's better, Matt. And, and this, you know, the spread is obviously close, but uh, I will be picking James Madison here. I think this Wisconsin team is vulnerable uh, and is going to get picked off by a very capable Dukes team. I just wish I had more evidence that JMU would be. I don't know. I think built for a more rugged crawl of a, an affair. I mean, they did lose the two games against App State, which I'm not saying App State, so Wisconsin, you know, apples to apples comparison, but there are more similarities in the way that they're both constructed. And the non con, they mostly just ran out bad teams or more perimeter oriented teams. I love JMU. I don't like Wisconsin. My head tells me Wisconsin gets this one. My, my stat nugget, Kai, Wisconsin, 350th nationally in field goal percentage allowed at the rim. If you get there, you are scoring. Yeah. And James Madison just barrages the rim. Yeah. And you mentioned the athleticism outside of AJ Storr, who is the most athletic person in the game, but uh, JMU wins the athleticism battle. Wisconsin's not easy to, to prep for. Flex screens, down screens, all the ball movement. Maybe that causes JMU some problems. But what pace will this game be played at? To Matt's point, 
No team allows less transition than Wisconsin. However, when they allow it, they don't stop it. Eighth percentile nationally points per possession. If JMU can get on the run, I think they find success. The question is, can they? I'm going JMU, though. I'm, I'm taking the sexy upset pick. Middle Tennessee, Minnesota vibes from a few years back when everyone chose that one, too. All right, Duke, Vermont. Matthews, Dukies against the Vermont Catamounts, who are always in the tournament every single season. Uh, analytically, Matt, did you know the Blue Devils are underseeded? Yeah, that's right. They're number eight in Kempom, yet they're a four seed. They handled mid-major competition pretty easily this season. Old Duke uh, did not play down, is what we'll say. Vermont played one power game this season. Guess who it was? It was at Virginia Tech. They lost by 23. However, they did beat Charleston and Yale. Okay, what do you think about this game? I think Duke wins and wins pretty easily, um, despite my longer-term concerns with Duke. I watched Vermont play a little bit, and, and John Becker, who's an awesome coach and a perennial mid-major powerhouse, uh, he's even kind of expressed the, man, this team just doesn't quite have our usual fastball, especially on offense, but we're really gritty and we can defend and we can you know play with anyone. So I, part of me thinks they have this connected, that they're going to be sticky team for Duke to really uh, separate from, but I, I don't feel like they have enough um, enough ammunition on offensively to keep up with the devil's chip, despite Duke, again, with some of their depth concerns, youth concerns, you could certainly argue as well. Um, and also, I mean, Vermont's got two like legit defenders with, uh, with Bogues and, um, Io Filet. How do you say his name? Oh, no, you got it. Uh, Io Filet close. Yeah, and, and Veretto's out. He's a really good big man. And Veretto is too. He, yeah. He right. could theoretically be back for this game. We don't know his status. He's kind of trying to recover from injury. I, I sort of am with you, Matt, in that I think it is close for a while, which is like every Vermont tournament game. And then eventually they kind of get overwhelmed and Duke's got plenty of scoring options. Is Caleb Foster back, Matt? Do, do you know for sure? Like, I'm not, not having I stopped caring. <laughs> okay. Then not having another guard showed up against NC State. It started because, to, yeah. Because because Proctor and Roach and McCain all had like bad games offensively and they didn't have another like guy to go to off the bench to provide a little bit of spark, a little bit of life. I hope he's back for their tournament run. Um, but regardless, Kai, I think Duke pulls away and ends up winning comfortably after some harrowing moments and maybe a halftime score that raises people's eyebrows. Yeah, Vermont hasn't shot well, but given how many threes they take, there's that variance aspect that comes into play here. To your point, it would not surprise me if Vermont led it half. They're well coached. They're smart. They're defensively very sound. I just think Duke is too talented, too big, too fast uh, to lose this game. But people have said that against Vermont before, and this team has generally surprised if memory serves in the tournament. Okay, 6-11 game. A sexy upset pick again, maybe. Texas Tech, the 6 is playing NC State, the 11. Not your typical Grant McCaslin team. Good on defense, Jim, but not elite. The offense has been good all season, though. Good shooting team. Pop, pop. Isaacs is a major weapon. And was NC State's run a flash in the pan, or was it for real behind DJ Burns? I sort of think more flash in the pan, although they've been playing better lately. I know Matt, Matt's probably got some numbers or, or data behind how well they've been towards the end of the year. I just think I, I want to trust Grant McCaslin in a tournament setting. He won the NIT last year at North Texas. He pulled off an upset against Purdue at North Texas a couple other years back. It's a very well coached team that's going to have a terrific game plan. They're not going to be like, oh, DJ Burns is big. Why didn't why wasn't this on the scouting report? <laughs> like they, they're going to be prepared for him going over the same, you know, right shoulders, the way he wants to finish. And the the one big question is is Warren Washington's health. Can he get back on the floor? He's been practicing a little bit for Texas Tech, their their big defensive center. He would be very helpful uh, against Burns one on one. But with Williams, I think is going to be okay with his ankle. And then the guard play for Texas Tech is just tremendous. Uh, I, I think far outstrips that of NC State, even with Horn back in the lineup. It's it's McCasland and his well-prepped team for me, Matthew. Not, not going to fall for the upset trap. I actually think NC State's guards, if you remove – I know Michael O'Connell has been good this year, I guess. I don't want to overly slander him. But I, I think their guard just talent-wise stack right up with Texas Tech – the coaching thing scares me. The gut just tells me the NC State's game. I think the Warren Washington, if he's out or, or hampered, like, you know, the Burns, you can scheme for him, but he's just such a force and so unique and so unorthodox. Like, I just know he, he's almost, he's going to get his, he's going to have an impact, especially if you don't have a counter up front to defend him. I think NC State keeps leaning on that. I mean, are we worried that they played 
six games in eight days. I know they have five or four days off, but like, my God, like, we're about Burnsy's knees, Kai. He's got to come out with two two braces it, on yeah. Thursday. He's going to be like, you know, hot. I mean, hey, for him, doesn't matter. I think he could play on two knees and still get buckets. But he's also I have a, NC State here. He's also a really good passer. He's great passer. He leads the team in assist rate. <laughs> he's he's awesome. Uh, I think he's legit. I think he's a problem if Washington doesn't play or, or is banged up. And I think Horn, Taylor, Morsell, it's a good guard trio, man. And they don't turn the ball over. They don't make mistakes. This is a game to watch. I I am. I'm really back and forth with this one. I'll probably end up doing an NC State against the spread pick, um, but I'm, I'm going to take Texas Tech to advance my bracket. Don't feel great about it, though, man. Don't feel great. Spread the needle there, Kai. I love yeah, it. And I yeah. met ten, Always ten the chat mentioning Texas Tech with pack line. They they typically like just double post ups. Uh, I think that will be the right move True. there. Although Virginia stopped doubling, it was weird. Like they're very much double the post, get the ball out of his hands, but he was picking them apart with passing, so they stopped doubling. Curious if Texas Tech goes the same route or if they get it out of his hands and, and rotate. Jim, second lock of the day, Matty Props specialist here. Uh, DJ Burns, the over on both points and rebounds. I think he's going to have a big game because McCaslin does the, you get yours, we'll stay home with shooters. We'll try and play three verse two with our shooters against your big. Your big, your uh-huh. very big, big. Okay. I Dangerous think you over an assist. Very interesting. I love Burns. I guess I should just be a portfolio of overs for... Burns is my general recommendation. So there you go. You can do very well there. Thank you. Kentucky and Oakland, the 314 matchup is where we're going next. Oh, Kai, can I say one more thing? Sorry. Of course you may. Yes. We, we, this is something we always do, but reminder that they are a miracle away from not even being here. Like they hit a miracle shot against to NC State hit a miracle shot against Virginia to yeah. make overtime. Virginia was up six with 45 seconds left. I frankly can't believe they, they won that game. Um, to put a quick bow on that, we're not done yet. Just saw the uh, two by two, some of the shot matrices from shot quality. Uh, the worst shot quality t- team in the field is NC State, which totally makes sense. Just a ton of mid range yes. contested, and <laughs> DJ Burns throwing circus shots, which he actually can make. So I'm fine with that. But uh, that 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 adds up. That equates. Okay, now Kentucky and Oakland. We've said it all year. Kentucky's top gear as good as anyone else's, and it should be. They have arguably the most raw talent and pro talent in the country. Uh, but, Matt, double-edged sword, they can lose to UNC Wilmington or St. Joe's, or they can compete with UNC and Tennessee. Oakland competes, man. I'm putting my finger at your screen. I know the horizon's been horrible in, in the tournament as of late, but they nearly won at Ohio State. They nearly won at Illinois. They beat Xavier at Xavier. Do you like your Golden Grizz? I, I do. We've been putting a few conferences in like the punching bag department of like the horizon, um, the OVC with Moorhead. I think those two Moorhead, big sky. Yeah. But I want to just OVC Moorhead and Oakland horizon. They, the right, the right team, I think came out of those tournaments that have the best chance to rise up as we've seen Oakland do twice, three times really. And they were tied with Drake with them to go in that game. They lost to, to the Bulldogs there, another tournament team. Um, it, Oakland's unique because of the zone gym, which could be a problem for the young freshman having to solve that for maybe a half. The other thing is Oakland's very unique offensively, and they don't really like run many pick and roll. It's a lot of like sets, like kind of mover blocker stuff, down screens, off the ball, more traditional, which you don't really see a ton of in the SEC schematically. Like I think the young guards have to really lock in on off ball defense, fighting through screens for 40 minutes, and they have to execute, be precise. I mean, it's a very high mental IQ challenge for the young UK guards. If they can solve it, yeah, they can win by 30 with the talent and the shot making, but you can see some real wrenches being thrown in the uh, the process. Matt, if you'd like some data support for that offense. I generally, I generally like, I generally do. Oakland is dead last in the country in both pick and roll ball handler possessions and pick and roll roll man. Like they wow, just don't last, run ball screens. Like it's not a part of their offense. It's not a huge, a huge thing. I think Kentucky, which is odd because they're, they're bad defending pick and roll sometimes the communication is issue has issues but this is a whole different kind of challenge that they haven't really been facing i think they could uh, ha- have problems there i don't think kentucky's going to have too much issues with the zone though they're scoring 1.24 points per possession against zone this year per synergy which is 17th in the country they haven't faced a lot of it because my god mm-hmm. they have shooting for days um but I, I, it's going to be hard for them for oakland to stick with that even if it is kind of, kind of like a matchup y one it's still, I think, UK can solve that. It might give them trouble for a bit, but yeah, Kentucky is the best three-point shooting team in the country. Uh, they don't crush the glass, which is good, because that's Oakland's kryptonite on the on the defensive end. 
I like Towson and Conway up front. And Jack Golke man, Blake Lampin, Lampman, flamethrowers. And they don't yeah, need much boys. time to shoot. Every yeah, time I'm watching Oakland, I'm like, guard Jack Golke. Then I realize, well, I guess they kind of are. He just only needs like a split second to yeah, get a he shot shoots off. from anywhere. Can, yeah, he's just yeah. incredible. And now he's going to be guarded by freshmen who get, you know, they see like butterflies and they start looking yeah. in the other direction, just like chasing right. ghosts. <laughs> Over <laughs> under a cow timeout with like four minutes in, and he's like furious that they left Golke for a three in the corner and land okay. open for the wing, and it's like 10 to <laughs> yeah. Oakland. It's like, oh, the Grizz. I, first, of, first of 15 Oakland. Yeah. That sounds yeah, like I a agree. very fun I agree bet. with that. Uh, yeah, that, that that could be a good time. Another one I think Oakland can keep it interesting for a bit. Uh, I do think Kentucky pulls away, wins, but I think Oakland can kind of make us think for for a second there. Yep. Uh, okay, Florida against the winner of Colorado State and Boise State. I think all three of us, or at least Jim and I for sure, were leaning Colorado in the first game. I think, Matt, you were thinking twice with Leon Rice a bit. That rhymes. But let's talk Florida. Uh, Micah Hanlocked in injury. It's a big problem for Florida. It's a key. He's a key part of what they do. He has the number one net rating on the team per CBB analytics. He's especially key on the offensive end. And Colorado is healthy now, man. And they're good, Matt. Williams, De Silva, Simpson, who I mentioned, is number 10 in Kenbon Player of the Year right now. They're going to be a pick, maybe even a slight favorite over Florida if they play them. Uh, what are your thoughts against for Florida against either Colorado or Boise State? I like Florida in either. Actually, I'm more worried about Colorado, but um, I do think the short turnaround will be not exactly what the doctor ordered for the Colorado team, who has struggled in the second parts of these turnarounds this season without the depth that they need. Now they're deeper, they're healthier, as we've talked about, but still, um, Florida is the deeper team. And I know even without uh, hand locked in up front, I still think they have more depth and they'll, they'll, they'll wear down for the presumably more gassed buffs team, Jim, in that spot in the, uh, the bracket. I know that he's a big loss. Mike H, but like, man, those other bigs are really good. Samuel's a beast. They do different things, um, though. Yeah, no, yeah. I know. I just, he's I think way more versatile. He's, like the elite he's more versatile. Offensive rebounder. Like, he yeah, is he is great. One of the best true. offensive rebounders in the entire country. Uh, Colorado did get a couple of road wins towards the end of the year. They swept the Oregon trip, but they are still 348th in the housing metrics away from home ranking. Uh, it's a team that, it's another elevation team. Like, if I'm throwing shade at some of the Mountain West teams, Colorado also qualifies there a little bit. It's just tough for Florida and for, for Golden Man, like back to the San Francisco team that lost the, the Mr. Squirrel, Masalski, right before the NCAA tournament. Squirrel. They lose hand logged in. Uh, hey, that's don't say that in front of Kentucky's defenders. They'll, they'll lose Jack Colkey. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, this it's it's kind of a tough matchup for, for Florida, I think, because of the size, the athleticism, the pro caliber talent, if it is Buffalo or if it is Colorado. I think Florida can handle Boise if it ends up being Boise. I'm not, I'm not as concerned there. And I think we, even with the loss of hand, hand locked in and Kugel, like weirdly being a zero for the Gators, that backcourt still absolutely rocks. Aberdeen had a monster game in the, the SEC tournament to give them a little more depth, even if Kugel still remains a non factor. Pulling Clayton are as steady as you go. Mm-hmm. So um, I think Florida wins either way. Yeah, I think Colorado gets them. Colorado gets them if they make it. I think Florida handles, handles Boise State. If that's the matchup, excuse me. Okay, Marquette. Western Kentucky, the two fifteen matchup here. Kolick is supposed to be back. Tyler Kolick, Marquette's point guard, obviously huge. Hey, guess what, Jim? Western Kentucky hasn't played a top 100 team all season outside of Louisiana Tech. Not a great schedule. They're also a blazing fast offensive team, which is usually bad against elite competition. Thoughts? Yeah, I don't trust Western Kentucky here. I, I like the talent on the roster. I think Steve Lutz is a very good coach. Great coach. And, and perhaps they stay within the spread. Not a betting show right now, but uh, I, Marquette's going to score at will here. I, I know Western Kentucky has a decent defense by some of the, the analytical rankings, but they just haven't seen an offense like this. If Kolick's back in there, it's arguably the best ball-moving team in the entire country between Kolick, Igadaro, and some of the other guys getting some of the point guard reps lately. That, that might end up being like a sneaky blessing in disguise for having more of that uh, tremendous sharing of the ball. And they can just score, man. Marquette gets great looks out of the pick and roll. They use their roll men, Igadaro especially, really, really well. And I love the 5-1 ball screen stuff they do where Kolek screens for Oso. And the point guard is like, I don't know how to cover the the ball screen as guarding the screener. Like it's just They just invert things, make it really difficult for teams to deal with. Uh, Matt, I think Marquette wins comfortably. I agree. Terrible matchup. I 
do believe Western Kentucky is a very dangerous team and would be a very dangerous threat if pinned against somebody else. Like, great coach and Steve Lutz, I think one of the better coaches that hasn't quite been discovered at the national mainstream level. Uh, and the talent, I mean, like, former Georgia Tech transfer, full-time starter, Rodney, uh, Rodney Howard. Brandon Newman, full-time starter at Purdue. Dante Allen, Kentucky, played multiple years there. Uh, Baba Carfe was on the, he was a starter on the Charleston team last year that almost beat San Diego State. Their best player, Don McHenry, is a Juco all star. Uh, Christian Lander, IU fans, is a role player. There is real talent from real power six pedigree on this team, coached by a real coach. So yep. take that for what it's worth. I do think the matchup's terrible. Marquette will just out, I guess, out Tasmanian devil them in the open floor with what they do. And if that's what this game turns into. Probably out. I and Allen probably out, I believe, too. Yeah, Thank you, Jim. got injured in the CUSA tournament. Yep. I, I love that Steve Lutz has never missed a tournament. He's three for three, despite coaching at Texas A&M, Corpus Christi, and Western Kentucky. Uh, I think Marquette's press and trapping is going to be a huge problem for, for Western Kentucky. Great. They're ball handlers. They're going to get overwhelmed. I don't see the Eagles having any issues scoring with their weapons. So, hey, over. Yeah, no, not a betting show, but lots of points in my opinion. I, I think Marquette gets the win. Yeah, why? Why aren't there eighty possessions here? Like Western Kentucky wants to run. Marquette will be fine. A very high scoring game against uh, his his Corpus Christi team played very high scoring with Alabama last yeah. year in the first round. It was like ninety six to seventy five. So I think we could see something similar. Uh, okay, let's do Sweet Sixteen, Elite Eight, Final Four picks. I'm going to start with Jim on this one. Okay, Kai, if you insist. Again, I don't think this region is very strong. I said it was the weakest. So I do have Houston defaulting to the Final Four. Joining them in the Sweet 16 is Duke, Texas Tech, and Marquette. I got McCasland taking out John Calipari, preventing Kentucky from a second weekend. Big Blue Nation, rabble rousers, torches, and pitchforks are headed to Lexington already. Uh, and then the Elite Eight, Matthew, I've got Houston and I'm, I want to wait to see Kolick's health before I pick that game. Um, Chaka has not been good in the tournament since he left VCU. That, that is very much worth noting. But I'm going to go Texas Tech with the upset pick there. They need to get healthy as well. Uh, but Houston to the final four is, is where I land. Mm, I just changed my pick. I had, I had Kentucky. I, I couldn't can't do it. Um, I just don't trust the youth. And I know my mother would kill me if I pick Kentucky. So I got to go Houston. Um, want to go Marquette? Don't know what I'm getting from Kolick. Don't know what that team. I, I worry about they're just another. They're one guard short with the way they play in the depth. That's my longer term concern with Marquette here, Kyle. We love the version we saw in November and December with all the pieces intact. We haven't seen that in a while, so I'm trusting can Houston over Kentucky in my Elite Eight matchup. To Jim's point, Shaka Smart has made nine NCAA tournaments since the Final Four in 2011. He has made zero second weekends in those nine tournaments. Wow. At VCU, Texas, and Marquette, three different schools. So Kai's taking Houston and Duke, Kentucky and Colorado. Houston versus Kentucky. Houston is my Final Four representative. And with that, I pass the ball over to Matthew for the Midwest for the region West. breakdown. No, I'll do Midwest. That's fine. No, Matt, Matthew, Midwest. I'm gonna let, Matt, I'm going to let you host the West. How about that? I'm going to make a concession for you live on air. Oh, thank you. Yeah, um, it's I'll just a more fun region. In. It's a more fun region. Don't we agree? The West. Didn't you say that it was the yeah. weakest region? It is, but it's the most. That's what makes it fun. It's who knows. All you can right, be the right. smartest fifth grader, or whatever you want to call it. The region right, of drama, we're, Kai. We're do, well, we're doing Midwest first, Matthew. We're going. Okay. We're, we're, we told the people clockwise. We got to stick to that. That's that's True. important. Continuity. Uh, so yeah, bottom right corner of the bracket, the Midwest, led by Purdue, the number one seed. Again, I keep calling this the Maui Invitational because for the top five, yeah, why not? Uh, we'll start with the num with the with the top game there, Matt. Purdue can either Montana State or Grambling give them a game, or is this just going to be a complete exercise of sixteen seed demons for Purdue? Uh, the latter. Um, Kai, fill in this airtime while I look up what Virginia did to the sixteen seed the year. Virginia after. was down at halftime. Down to Gardner, Gardner Webb. Webb. Gardner yeah. Webb, and then they right? destroyed them in the second half. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that that'll happen. Purdue will struggle. The world will come to the edge of its seat, and then Purdue will win by ten going away. That's that's the that's the archetype. Uh, check what time get this game is on Friday because if it's early, where everybody is like super locked in, they they will lose their minds. Um, it's it's a bloodbath either way, guys. I hate to I hate to tell you, uh, both Grambling and Montana State can put full court pressure on Purdue, but it's not the same level as FDU. 
I, I'm worried slightly more about Montana State because they're shooting. But yes. gri- but I yeah, I Grambling. Look, they're athletic. I don't think no. they can hold a candle to Purdue. Purdue. Purdue beat Sanford by 45 points. They just bugs. They squash. They squash bugs. And FDU obviously was an outlier uh, last season. How you right about Montana yeah. State's pressure? Robert Ford and A. Turner are good. I think they can. But it's not mess with. Foster. It's not the same, man. I, I don't know. No, I know. Also, Braden Smith, put some respect on his name. He's a top five point guard in the country this year. First team All Big Ten. The guy is better than last season. Yeah, and he's good. Nice part. Should be fully healthy. I, I, yeah, I don't it seems think fine. he looked. He didn't look awesome in that. Uh, the Wisconsin game wasn't really scoring the ball, but uh, yeah, he did play thirty six minutes in an overtime game. So. I would think he's think he's healthy. Uh, yeah, Kai, to your point, Purdue's results against inferior competition this year: Sanford by forty-three, Moorhead State by thirty. Those are two NCAA tournament teams. Texas Southern by thirty-two, Jacksonville by forty-three, Eastern Kentucky by twenty twenty-seven. Seven. Yeah. I'm trying yep. to do the math there. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, like none of those are close. I, I think this team completely rids themselves of that sixteen seed demon. Yeah. All right, next game, Utah State and TCU, the 8-9 matchup here. Got a Mountain West team. You're right, Jim is going to continue fading them. I also think Jamie Dixon's a really good tournament coach. Had a very fun time betting again, betting him against Seton Hall a couple of years back when they absolutely nuked Seton Hall in the first round. Matthew, what are you looking at here? This is Utah State's first matchup with a team from a power conference. <laughs> Wild. Yeah, it, Jim, add the uh, – I'll throw more – more logs in the fire here. If we're going to torch Utah state, I guess sounds like we are I, the TCU, a, a big 12 team, like with the size they have reinstated, getting good back up front and kind of their coaches already, maybe likely potentially talking to Washington and might be working the contracts behind the scenes. I just think Utah state's toast. Um, where they blew that game in the, the uh, mountain West tournament, I think just is a bad omen for what's going to come against a, sort of a rejuvenated TCU team that I was down on, but I think it's kind of got a little bit of their groove back lately. Yeah. And, and Dixon's gotten out of the first round each past two years. So he he's proven he's, he can win in, in this matchup, Utah state. The fact that they haven't played a power team, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit hypocritical because New Mexico hasn't either, but that worries me. Five of their six losses this year have come on the road or neutral floors. That worries me. TCU's rotation, TCU's rotation of bigs to throw at great Osibor, Uday, Cork, Mustafa Coles is more of a wing, but they have the size. Also, they're top three in experience in the country, TCU. The guards are excellent. Nelson, Anderson, Tennyson. The wings are probably the biggest edge they have, the size of their wings. With Miller, PV, I'm going to say Coles again, O'Bannon. The size and athleticism of the wings, I think, tip the scale in favor of TCU here, Jim. I'm going TCU. Yeah, I love TCU here. The size, athleticism. If if you can combat Asabor, it puts a huge huge onus on those guards to make plays, and they're they're not all stars. Um, remember, Asabor was a key piece on the Montana State team last year. So was Darius Brown. They got absolutely blitzed. Uh, Wax. Kansas State beat them by like fifteen. And then two years ago, they lost by forty to Texas Tech. Yeah. Um, it Sprinkle has not been able to measure up in in. Uh, in the tournament coming out of the big sky, I don't think he'll be able to coming out of the Mountain West either. So I love TCU. Next, we have Gonzaga in a very intriguing matchup with McNeese, the 5-12 battle here. Gonzaga second to Purdue in the entire country in rate of post-ups used. Not surprising the way they play through Graham E.K. and Huff and all those guys on the block, even Watson. McNeese has some bodies, Kai, but they're, you know, their center and Tavian Collins more of a stretch big. Shoemate's only 6'6". Mm-hmm. Can McNeese hold up inside, or is their perimeter pressure going to be what makes the difference? McNeese is no joke. Uh, I know they're kind of a popular pick to to upset Gonzaga. The spread's like six, so it's not, it wouldn't be a huge um, upset by any means. They've played two top 100 teams this year. They beat VCU by 11. They lost a lot of tech by nine. We know they beat Michigan and Michigan. Michigan's not a top 100 team. Gonzaga's by far the best team they've played all season. And Gonzaga, one thing they didn't do this year was play down a competition. Like Purdue, they smashed the Bucs. Uh, few hasn't lost in the first round since 2008. McNeese does have power level talent, but Gonzaga can handle, Gonzaga can handle the ball. Uh, the, the pressure, this isn't the Southland, man. Gonzaga's got ball handlers to handle the pressure. And EK, the, the size advantage Matt up front is huge. Good luck stopping Graham EK. I don't think they can do it. Gonzaga's discipline on D, they're not going to pick up cheap fouls. This isn't the Southland. I wouldn't be surprised if it's close. 
close, excuse me, Matt, but I think the uh, Gonzaga pulls it out at the end. So Zags for me. I like the Zags. Here's my concern. Or I guess we'll just a more interesting observation about McNeese in this matchup. Like we haven't seen a team that's this good from a league this bad in a while. Um, like you got to go it's back under, to like Wood, Stephen F. Austin. Exactly. I was just pulling up the side by side comparison, Shim. Um, that team, what closed as a favored, a favorite, I believe, is a 14 seed against Notre Dame, the three seed in the first round. Yeah, Tom uh, Walkup. That game. Thomas Walkup. Oh yeah. Thomas Walkup oh, yeah. and the boys. Yeah, right. I mean, that was an all time team. Like just fun. All the way through. Sorry, they beat West Virginia. They were favored against the sixth seed in the round of 32. You know why, Matt? Because the committee didn't use predictive metrics to seed the tournament that year. They didn't know what they were doing. Yeah. So, I, <laughs> McNeese, guess what? They forced turnovers. They're going to shell and really crowd in the paint. When they played Louisiana Tech earlier in the season, another team with big, two big bigs, they forced La Tech to shoot a ton of threes. I think they try and bait them into a ton of threes, Gonzaga. So, we need to see how the guards – like – if you can just not be baited into shooting 43s in this game, and say, you should just pick and mull your way inside. Um, but I think the parallels of the SFA team, Jim, with Walkup and Underwood are, are interesting here in this context. Yeah, I think the shooting stuff is what I was just highlighted looking at, at stats. Um, McNeese gives up a ton of threes. They play zone on 12% of possessions, but even their man is very like zone-esque, compact, wants you to go over the top. It's great in the Southland, a league that doesn't have a ton of great perimeter shooting. That's all like downhill, get to the free throw line type stuff. But, you know, they give up the third highest spot up rate in the country. Gonzaga takes spot up jumpers at the 357th rate. Like it, it's a weird kind of like weakness meets strength or, or stylistic mm -hmm. type of thing. Gonzaga is going to have to pound it inside against a defense that tends to resist it. I just think they're good enough to do it, Kai. Um, and, and Nemhard has been controlling the game in an in incredible way recently. Uh, I think they're able to win, and you know, not not a betting show. I don't know about the cover, but I'm not going to pick McNeese. There, there's a couple five seeds I would have taken them to beat, and Gonzaga's not one of them. Uh, Matt, yeah, SFA beat West Virginia by 14 in the first round. Lost Notre Dame and by one. Notre Dame, Notre Dame was right. a six. It was a buzzer yeah. beat. There's a tip, and I think uh, Carmody or one of those dudes tipped yeah. down. What yeah. No, that, that predated Carmody. Uh, Carmody. Um, and, and insanely. Rex Fluger, sexy college, Rexy. Like sexy season. Rexy, yeah. I think. That's right. There yeah. you go, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, next up, the 413 matchup. KU, the Jayhawks, reeling Boom. lately, considering their injuries. Kansas taking on Samford in the first round. Kai showing off his Mizzou Tiger home field gear for those listening at home. Trust me, he's wearing it. Uh, Matt, I think Kansas is actually a pretty solid antidote to the buckyball pressure. Uh, Samford is number one in the country in press rate. They're also number one in the country in defensive efficiency when pressing. Uh, how about that? Like that combination of volume and efficiency when pressing. But can that play up against a team with multiple ball handers in the front court and the back court? I, I have my questions about that. So where where do you land on KU versus Samford? Yeah, that was my first gut too. Is like I think KU can just carve up every what Samford, all of the gimmicks that Samford brings to bear. I talked about this on our show last night too. Sanford's playing a little more of this like one, three, one shell ish zone. We saw it in the SOCON tournament. I wonder if we see that again, in this matchup, like, Hey, KU, we know you can't shoot. We're going to sit back and make Justin Timber fake and El Marco Jackson <laughs> and Johnny Furphy make open jump shots and not let anything get, you know, past our, our, our backline defense, which again has been re fortified by the returns of those bigs who were out for a period of time. They're not like massive, space eaters but they are athletic and they are capable of at least combating you know kj adams now hunter's a different beast also he might just look too big but i think there's actually more in the in the tank for samper that give them a fun upset chance than i initially thought kai i still landed with kansas and i feel pretty good about it yeah i think kansas wins pretty easily um obviously dixon dickinson and uh, mcculler's health they loom large i think both are going to play uh I, I think they'll be healthy obviously that's the caveat I just can't shake the first game of the season out of my head, man. Sanford lost by 53 points to Purdue. That's the only top 100 team they played all season except for VCU, who they also lost to. Sanford crushed the SoCon. I don't think they can step up in competition because partially of their style. Yeah, you're not going to bother Dwan Harris or Kevin McCuller with your pressure. There's zero answer for KJ Adams. And with respect for uh, to Achor Achor, Dickinson's going to murder him. Sanford's not going to score inside. I think KU wins pretty easily. Yeah, the interior scoring is a real problem for, for Sanford. I'm not sure how they get through a very strong KU shell. They do not give up many shots at the rim per hoop math. 
Uh, and Kansas is also a tremendous transition defense. They, they keep you yes. out of it, and yeah. they are very good when you are running uh, at preventing bad shots. And Samford is mega reliant, uh, top 10 nationally in initial field goal per or initial field goals taken in transition per hoop map. They want to go, they want to get out and go. Uh, and I'm just not sure KU is going to let them. One concern, I guess, uh, Samford can hit shots over the top. That team has a bunch of shooters. Uh, that that could keep this game close, considering KU does allow jumpers over the top. But uh, I just think the the paint battle is such a monstrous advantage for KU, and they won't turn it over, which fuels the transition attack. Next, we have South Carolina and Oregon. Kai already called it out as the most vulnerable six seed. Hmm. Analytically, that is factual. It's very hard to debate that, given where they stand in Ken Palm and some of the predictive stuff and how they've gotten blown out. They take on Oregon. Dana Altman, sneakily Mr. March, a tremendous yeah. coach in the dance. Once he gets there, they are playing their crazy changing defenses. Kai, is that going to bother a very Wisconsin-esque system at South Carolina where they like to invert the floor? Yeah, South Carolina, the weakest six seed. Tough, tough to seed. So many good wins. They really couldn't be any lower. But every single at-large team outside of Virginia would be favored over South Carolina on a neutral floor. That tells you where they kind of stand in in the grand scheme of things. Oregon's playing into playing to its potential right now. Again, 2019, the Ducks won the Pac-12 tourney. They made they they got a 12 seed in the dance. They made the Sweet 16. They nearly made the Elite Eight. They're healthier. Matt, I think and Folly Dante and Kwame Evans are a fantastic answer for Murray Boyles and BJ Mack. Shell Sad's a star, just a freshman. And Jim's point, Altman, attorney god, seven appearances with Oregon in the tournament. Two second rounds, three Sweet 16s, one Elite Eight, one Final Four. Uh, Oregon is my pick in this game. Yep, Oregon because they have in Dante, who's an absolute monster. Like I think people don't realize how dominant he is if you're not on the West Coast. Dana did Altman, you see what he did in the Pac-12 title game? 12 for 12 from the field against Colorado. <laughs> like a pretty right, big like a team. good front line. <laughs> Look at his yeah. Arizona numbers. We're good. Like he's dominating legitimate front lines. Like as much as we want to poke fun of the Pac-12, they, there are big guys out there. So Dante dominating those is notable. Um Dana Altman, check. Uh the Jermaine <laughs> Kuznard <laughs> revenge factor, check. Wow, I forgot about that actually. Good point. And then Jackson Shellstad, our boy, just has good. Kai, you're you're made for March mojo written doesn't he? I, yes. I just like this whole situation. It does. One concern Dana Altman talked about how they have a short turnaround, quick travel, and that they're end of the they're at the end of their academic quarter because I guess they do the quarter system, ah. so they have like a lot of stuff to like take care of tomorrow. It, it, it sounded like he was really disheveled. It's like Dana, you're going to the tournament. Like, what do you focus on that, my guy? Like, he had like a whole like admin list to do tomorrow. So like, I know it's complicated, but anyway, I think Oregon wins this game, Joe. Yeah, I do too. I, my my one concern for the Ducks would be shot selection type stuff. They can get tempted into taking bad shots offensively and. South Carolina gives up the 14th most mid-range jumpers in the country. That's part of that Wisconsin DNA. Take you off the three-point line, but also kind of keep you from the rim. Just tease you into those floaters, the pull-ups, despite not being huge at the rim. Uh, but, man, Kai, the emergence of Colin Murray boils, but you've got to go he's against very good. Nefali Dante, but he's like six. Exactly. Eight. That's that's my... <laughs> it's a horrible matchup for them. Yeah, he'd be a problem against most other teams, not against Oregon, in my opinion. Yep, yep. All right, next we have Creighton and Akron, the three versus 14 here. Creighton out of the Big East. The jump shooting Jays, Matthias, that's what you call them. And I've completely stolen that nickname on every single show. I just, I talk about Creighton. They basically turn all games into jump shot contests. They run you off the three point line, but Kalkbrenner protects the rim. They want to fire away from deep. In most games, they're going to be the better jump shooting team. However, the, the variance could bite them against a very good tournament coach in John Gross. How do you see Creighton versus Akron? Yeah, I thought Creighton would murder Akron when I first saw the bracket. I was like, no, Akron's, they're kind of a tough bug to squash, right? Like they have size up front. Um, while their guards are where I have question marks, they're not going to be bothered. Like Creighton's not going to, Creighton allows you to kind of do what you want to do and they try and just funnel you into less efficient stuff, but you're not going to be un comfortable playing Creighton. You're not going to be bothered or flustered. And so for a backcourt, I don't really trust. I like that as sort of the the arena you're going into, right? You don't play go against like super frenetic pressure like Auburn or something like that, right? So I'm kind of in on the Akron thing. I know you guys were were, were zipper doo dying all the way through our uh, our bracket discussions offline. I think I'm joining. I think I'm a zipper. 
Man, I come on board. After you trashed Akron so hard for weeks. Which I stand by. I stand by in this matchup. I think it is competitive, but Creighton still marches on. Yeah, Akron can hang, man. Just like they hung with UCLA back in 2022. The team's old. Enrique Freeman and Ali Ali are power level players. Guard play might be a problem, to your point, Matt, but the matchup, Creighton cannot exploit bad ball handling. Dead last in the country and turnover rate forced. That's huge. Uh, Freeman versus Kalkbrenner matchup is going to be awesome. Akron needs to get out on shooters. They've had a pretty good defensive uh, three-point defense this year. Excuse me. It should be slower paced. Akron's going to make this a war. I'm taking Akron outright. This is my crazy pick in the bracket first round. Akron over Creighton. Also, I realize that I have no Big East teams in Sweet 16. That might bite me in the ass, but I'm going to do it anyways, Jim. Akron over Creighton. There are only three of them in the tournament, Kai, and the Big East fans are crying out for help. After that happened, Providence, St. John's, and Seton Hall all left out of dance. I think Akron keeps it close, but uh, Creighton wins. Very, very similar to that matchup he referenced against UCLA. Another really good shot-making team mm-hmm. with with uh, Hakez and Juzang and all those guys. My one concern, I guess, matchup-wise here is the drop coverage stuff. Like, you need a guy who can make the mid-range jumper, the pull-up, and that's not really Akron's strength with their lack of a backcourt. But I think we see Ali Ali handle the ball some, and he can actually make some shots off the bounce And with, with Kalkbrenner sitting back there under the rim taking everything away. Jim, I remember back in 2022, almost positive we were on UCLA and expecting yep. to roll over Akron, and Akron just hung with him the entire game. It was like, oh, this team's actually pretty legit. And I, I think it's going to be a similar type of thing. Yeah, 58 possession game. That yeah, was. just slog I, it out, I, man. Yeah, I could see this being a similar. Again, Gross is really smart. Mm-hmm. He's going to slow it down and, and make it that way because he, he doesn't want the talent gap to play out and increase the variance when a team is such a jump shooting squad. Now we have the 7-10 matchup. Texas, the only one locked in here, waiting to see who wins between Virginia and Colorado State. That Tuesday night muck fest. Matt, you got Rodney Terry waiting for uh, whoever emerges from that. Do you trust him and the very talented Longhorns, who also have Brock Cunningham, to get through to the second round? <laughs> yes, I do. I think a great draw for Texas. Um, Nico Medved versus Rodney Terry. Should that come to pass? I may have to rethink that. Or, but or like Tony Bennett. Bennett. Or Tony Bennett, With sorry. Respect. Yeah, well, no respect given this year. I just don't think the team is very good. Sorry, Tony. I love you. I wish you back in your career doing whatever you do after nice the season. Man. Nice man. Uh, great guy. Texas has that dangerous factor again. It's dumb as cliche as it sounds. I, I do feel like it has shades of last year where they just have a lot of really talented guards, various types of, um, you know, offensive, defensive minded. They can play both sides of the ball. Their front line has been kind of a moving musical chairs of like who's healthy, who's not, but, but when they're all there, man, they can go. I think Texas is going to beat Rick Barnes and a little revenge matchup next round teaser. I'd like Texas to the sweet 16. I don't feel good about that, but I do. Yeah. I don't think Texas will beat Tennessee. Uh, I, I, I do not think they will, uh, but I think Texas beats either team here too much talent. I think Dylan DC is going to be a nightmare matchup, especially for Colorado state. And Max Asmus is already a tournament hero, man. He can do it again. Elite, uh, Texas te- Texas was in, was in the Elite Eight last year. I mean, Max Aismas, like lives it for the second weekend in March. So I, I do like Texas uh, to beat either one of these teams. Yeah, I'm with you. I don't have any great matchup points because I don't know who they're playing, and I, there's already enough games to research, so I haven't dug into yeah. the theoretical Texas versus Virginia game that I don't want to watch on, I guess, what is that? That'll be <laughs> Thursday. Um, but yeah, I... I the, the coaching matchup would, would make me have some pause on investing much money uh, mm-hmm. if I were on this game. But I am picking Texas. I think between Ace Miss's leadership and the veteran presences on that team. So despite having Brock Cunningham, Texas moves on into the second round. Tennessee St. Peter's. Guys, I think this is a blowout. I'm sorry, St. Peter's. I know that you have been a darling as a 15 seed before in this tournament. But they can't really shoot, but they also don't get points in the paint. And Matt, they're going to be completely overwhelmed athletically. I think Tennessee rolls. Uh, I agree. Tennessee by a lot of points, despite Tennessee's early round trials and tribulations. At least this year, they have an offensive antidote and don't connect, Kai, among other cheaters. Yeah. Uh, so I picked against St. Peter's every single game when they made their run to the Elite Eight, <laughs> uh, every game against the spread. Also, 
this team is not that team. This team is a 16 seed masquerading as a 15 seed. It just so happened that tournament shook out, shook out shaken out, shock, whatever, you know what I'm saying, to where they got the 15. Maybe they can get Tennessee in a slog and things get sweaty, but this is not the same Vols team either. They're built to score this year. They run. Very key. If they were a half-court team, you'd be a little more nervous about it. I, I don't think they're going to have any problem with St. Peter's. Bully ball is not going to work in this tennis, against this Tennessee team, and they're going to pester the hell out of ball handlers for St. Peter's. Don't connect. No equal. Tennessee for me. Yeah, we looked at the Tennessee-Longwood matchup from one angle with Longwood getting smashed. This is the kind of mirror image of it where Tennessee has the physicality to match what St. Peter's does. And even if St. Peter's tries to slow it down, I don't think the Peacocks can find enough ways to score here. They're not going to have the miraculous savant level shot making that the the team did had a few years back against Kentucky. That was such a outrageous outcome. Remember Tennessee blew out Wright state in the first round one year, they blew out Longwood. Like yeah. they're not altogether hopeless uh, against mid-major competition. It's, it's really been, Oregon State, a power com a power conference team that knocked them off. That that's typically been more of their their bugaboo as they get further into the dance. Uh, Sweet Sixteen, Final Four, Elite Eight picks. I'll start, guys. I have Purdue and Gonzaga rematch from Maui. I have Oregon and Texas I'm joining Matthew. Feels a little bit crazy to have Rodney T making it that far, but I do. And then Purdue over Oregon to go to the Final Four. Kai, what do you got? Alrighty, I've got Purdue and Gonzaga. Gonzaga over Kansas. I got Oregon against Tennessee. Purdue over Tennessee. A little chalk there. Uh, ones and twos don't match up very much in the Elite Eight. I think they do in this bracket. So Purdue over Tennessee. Purdue wins. Final four. Was, I think Stucky tweeted that it hasn't happened since Michigan State Duke in 2019. Yeah. It's the last one versus two Elite Eight matchup. Very, that's crazy. why the bracket is impossible to, to pick. One in 120 billion if you know... A little bit about college basketball, apparently. That's tough. Matthew, your Sweet 16 Elite Eight Final Four. I have Purdue beating Gonzaga. A little rematch of the, uh, what was it? That, uh, was that Maui? Yeah, Maui, right? Yes. No. We're, Maui, yes, correct? Maui. Thank you. Yeah, this is the Maui region. Thank you. Maui Midwest. Um, and then I have Oregon beating Texas. Purdue beating Oregon, Jim. I'm with you in the Elite Eight. One versus yep, 11. We're, we're very aligned all the way down there, Matt. Uh, so... Automatic consensus is going to be right. Sorry, Kai. Matt and I agree, so it's a lock. You're sleeping on Tennessee. Yeah, probably. Okay, Matthew, to you, and you are hosting your beloved West region. Oh, can we do a home field ad real quick? Drama. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, still, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, home field apparel, yada, yada. Jim's wearing the hoodie. I'm wearing the sweatshirt. They're the best collegiate premium apparel uh, business website, whatever you want to call it, in the game. They got joggers now. They got some cool jerseys up on the site for a few teams, including Mizzou. Hello, hello. Bombers, the jackets. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. For the uh, spring, Kai, you want to rep one of those? Absolutely. I rep all of them, Jim. At the same time, jackets on top of jackets. Homefieldapparel.com. Promo code 3MW at checkout uh, to get 15% off your first order. Again, so many schools. I'm sure they'll make a ton of new shirts from this very NCAA tournament. Uh, check them out, man. Homefieldapparel.com. Boom, that's it. Matthew, West Thank Region. Man. Should we talk pigs? Oink, oink. We talked pigs Howard, in the beginning. Howard Wagner. Yeah. Winner will play North Carolina. Do they have a chance, Jim, out of the shoot? Yes, no. Worth worth uh, I, penny I think, thoughts. I think if Howard gets in there, they do what they did with Kansas last year in the 116, make right. some shots, hang around for a little while, and then just get overwhelmed by the talent, the up-tempo nature of the game. Howard is a pace taker. They're going to play your pace. I think they play a slog against Wagner in the first round, then they get up and down with uh, with Carolina in that round and eventually get overwhelmed by the Tar Heels. Yeah, uh, I mentioned it when we talked the pig between Howard and Wagner, but Howard has played good teams pretty close this season. Um, I don't think it's crazy that Howard can hang slash scare UNC for a bit. Legit talent, one of the best free throw attempt rates in the country, one of the best offensive rebounding rates in the country as well. But UNC will win this game. There's no 16-1 upset this year, I'm afraid. I agree. UNC wins. Um, Howard's kind of a fun story. I, I hope they win so they can get more blood. Just the fact that back to back uh, tournaments, right? Yep. Uh, Jim, your boy Poopy Blakeney, obviously at the helm's fun. And then um, they got the kid who's doing the law degree. What's his name? The only players. Yeah. Well, no, there's another player who's getting his law degree. 
currently yeah. while playing, which I think is like the first only guy who's doing it. Yeah, cool thing. Howard, rooting for you. You have no chance against UNC. We will now talk Mississippi State versus Michigan State. Kai, I think John Fendler on Twitter pointed out that if Michigan State were to win, and Mississippi State also kind of falls in this group, but the, the spread in that round of 32 matchup would be awfully narrow between UNC and Sparty. Do we have any... Um, are we holding out hope for an Izzo in March renaissance, or are we sort of just kind of over this Michigan State team and, and oh. what they are, and, and we know what they are at this point? First of all, this is the first game of the first round, so yay, this is it. Uh, yeah, Izzo in March, <laughs> question mark, question mark. He's lost six times in the opening round, so it's happened before. It might happen again. If you believe that Michigan State was top five in the AP poll in the preseason and that they were number 13 in Kempom in the preseason – I think you like Michigan State here. They don't lack experience. They have senior guards. They have Tom Izzo. Mississippi State is no picnic. The type of physicality they bring, though, Jim, that's a nightly thing in the Big Ten. Michigan State has seen this type of physicality before. Can they keep them off the glass? That's the question mark. I think they will force turnovers, make it hell on their ball handlers, dig at uh, their their post-ups with Tola Smith and and Tyson Walker. One of those guards is tailor-made for March. That's a good shooting team that's going to get good looks. I like Michigan State. I do think they're going to give North Carolina some issues too in the second round. This game is going to be ugly. I think. I, I think it's going to end up bogged down in the half court. Jans is going to have a good prep uh, plan for Michigan State's typical transition attack, where they run and then they slow down and run a bunch of set stuff. But they do try to get out and go early. And Michigan State's one of the best transition defenses in the country. Mississippi State's not really going to run. Neither team's going to get much at the rim, Matthew. Just given the way the defenses are structured. I know that Michigan State has issues at the center spot, but like the, they still don't give up much at the rim, even with those guys kind of having their ups and downs. Mississippi State, mega athletic. Can they get on the offensive glass? Debatable. I think maybe a little bit. Izzo harps on this team's lack of toughness fairly frequently, and I don't think yep. they're all that great <laughs> in terms of leadership with, with Hogarth at the helm. I think I'm going Mississippi State here, Matt. I don't feel awesome about it, but I just don't get the warm and fuzzies from this Sparty team. I agree. I, I locked in Jans right away. I didn't think twice about it. I'm not scared of Izzo. I'm not scared of the Michigan State perennial program track record. I don't I don't care. Um, I know what I'm getting with Stark Vegas and Chris Jans. They're getting just a swarming defensive fortress with length everywhere. And you have Josh Hubbard who's the ultimate. I mean, Josh Hubbard might be the best guard in this in this game. And no, you're Michigan State. Tyson Walker, you're, best guard in this game. I, I, I said, will you relax? I said, he might be the best guard in this game. I'm he just saying he's not. Confidence highs. <laughs> I'm saying there's a chance in this game he plays on, as the on best guard. Day. On yes. one day, you're saying. Okay. You're, yes. You're not saying. Yeah, exactly. He is, he is like, I think Gottlieb said or someone else, said, like he is very much a, his ceiling is ultra high, right? He's good. Like I, I think he can easily outplay Tyson Walker for a game. I'm not saying he's better than Tyson Walker. Tyson Walker's proven longer track record, older, all that stuff. But that's been Mississippi State's problem in the past. Like they, they kind of needed that guy. They needed someone to make – to loosen up the offense when their half court suck gets a little bit too bogged down. And Michigan State's defense has been really good, by the way. Top 10 nationally, third in the Big Ten. So again, Josh Hubbard is my guy. He's the ultimate X Factor. I think he outplays Tyson Walker in this game. And Mississippi State advances guy. Man, freshman pl- outplaying the, the seventh year senior, the <laughs> eighth year senior Tyson Walker. Hubbard's wow. good. I agree. Hubbard's He's fun. really good. He's really good. He's I fun. totally He's agree. Fun. Uh all right, let's talk St. Mary's Grand Canyon. A an interesting West Coast quasi mid major showdown. Two elite coaches with, um, you know, talent pound for pound. Kai Grand Canyon, Tyon Grant Foster, size up front, uh, abundance of both on on each sideline here. This game feels ugly to me. Um, as excited as I was for this matchup, I was sort of kind of like left with a sour taste in my mouth as I thought more about it. It's like, yeah, this might just be a really ugly type of game that neither team really feels like they deserve to win. Uh, it'll be a popular upset pick. This is the third straight year of St. Mary's is five seed. They beat Indiana by 29. They beat VCU by 12. St. Mary's is very good. They're underrated every single season by bracket pickers, and every year they deliver. Uh, Grand Canyon's excellent. I, I do think Tyon Grand Foster is a pro. The guard play is great. They're experienced. And they did beat San Diego State at home, uh, so they have wins. But you can't bully the glass against St. Mary's, man. They're built for that. I, I don't see Grand Canyon scoring easily. And on the other end, top three offensive rebounding team, St. Mary's versus number 207, Grand Canyon defensive rebounding team. The execution that St. Mary's gonna, is going to bring is going to slice and dice the Lopes who are away from home. 
a huge home court advantage for Grand Canyon. And guess what, Jim? St. Mary's has played in Spokane a few times. Uh, Eileen St. Mary's. Little familiarity up there. In fact, they won in Spokane mm-hmm. this year. Not, not at, This is not at the kennel, of course, but uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think that matters a little bit. St. Mary's just doesn't beat themselves. Like they don't turn it over. They don't take bad shots. They force you to take a bunch of mid-range jumpers against their, you know, they, they don't bring more than two to the ball in ball screens. They don't help off of shooters. So it's going to have to be a lot of Grant Foster, like trying to power through Mitchell Saxon at the rim or taking pull-up jumpers or Ray Harrison shooting floaters over the top. And that's just going to be largely inefficient over a large sample size. So yeah, Matt, I, I, had a really hard time with this game for a while going back and forth because I think the individual talent and athleticism edge does maybe tip a little bit to Grand Canyon, but Randy Bennett is just such a wizard with the way he coaches and and makes sure that they're relatively unprone to upsets. And I I don't think they get upset here. I I think they're, like I said, able to dominate the glass and and get enough easy baskets inside. Yeah. St. Mary's has been made fun of for their long scoring droughts. They've had some pretty, not you know infamous ones both this year and last season grand canyon could do that too though like their offense can get a little bit one-dimensional hey tie on bail us out sometimes um even with their guards i just don't all the way trust it i think this could get a like this is very undery for me um yep and i like st mary's written down as well i have st mary's as sort of the edge in that type of battle um i guess it's good for grand canyon though finally to play a team doesn't press you all the floor like you have to be sick of playing all those whack teams all year and then finally get a, a chance to breathe uh, as they will against St. Mary's. Uh, uh, one, one, uh, one little stat nugget. Is yeah. Grand Canyon is 27th nationally in free uh, field goal percentage from the mid range. They're going to have to take a billion of them here. Perhaps they do hit enough tough jumpers to hang around, but I just trust St. Mary's. Yeah. Good point. Grant Foster Harrison can, can make those for sure. Um, all right. Game that will actually be fun. And this is a very convoluted matchup. I, I tied my brain in a pretzel <laughs> trying to pick a game, a winner here, Kai. Alabama Charleston, um, historically high total, historically fun game, stylistic extremes clashing. Pat Kelsey, Nate Oates, cocaine revved up, fourth <laughs> gear, Mach five pace. Who has the edge in this one? Yeah, maybe the funnest game in the first round. Total is going to be around one seventy. It's going to be over seventy five possessions. There might be 63 point attempts, like no, no hyperbole. Both teams might shoot 33s. Uh, Charleston has played three top 100 opponents this year. Lost to Duquesne by 18, lost to FAU by 16. They did beat St. Joe's, beat them by seven. Bama can torch teams, man. Their offense is scary good, among the best in the past 20 years. I'm not worried about their recent state. Charleston's transition defense grades out as poor in synergy, allowing 1.15 points per possession, 342nd in the country. I'm taking Alabama. Yeah, I, I think it's a battle of two good offenses. I'm taking the better one, uh, and that that is Alabama and Nate Oates. They get to the rim or they take threes. They're good at both of those things. The defense is a major issue, but Charleston's defense is worse. So uh, it, it's just not a great setup for an underdog to play a million possessions against an awesome offense. That That's like the epitome of letting the talent gap there out. So, Matt, well, while Charleston is fun and this game is going to be a blast to watch, uh, I think Alabama pulls away and, and keeps it at arm's length with their ridiculous offensive attack. Yeah, I think I started my journey in this handicap with the I worry about Charleston stepping up in class, how Alabama has just obliterated really good mid-major teams right now. But I ended up to the point where Alabama's defense is just so untrustworthy right now. And I, I don't feel like they're all of a sudden going to figure it out with the light bulb against Charleston's offense, which is not just potent, but like highly complex in nature. Um, I think this game is very close for a very long time. Um, and it'll be a very, very high scoring game. I don't know if Charleston has enough um, bolts in the chamber to get over the hump. Cause Alabama's shot making is like, if you haven't seen them play uh, like at Kentucky level, when, when they're going with the Strata and, uh, it's, it's, and it's Sears, so it's it's like, terrifying. Kind of, Kai mentioning the three point attempt rates. Like this game is mega high variance. It's be awesome. Like if <laughs> it's it's tough to bet a side in this game, but uh, this is the possession count. I think that matters for lots of points. Uh, quick plug: Kobe Rogers is a hashtag my guy. One of the best unsung like role players in college basketball. One of the key cogs of Charleston attack. You and I, I think he's gonna make a big difference in this game against Alabama's guards. All right, we continue in the region of drama. To drama with seeding the Mountain West, New Mexico 11 seed playing Clemson, the sixth seed. 
conference wars commence, Mr. McKeon. Obviously, New Mexico underseeded per the predictive metrics. Have they figured it back out off the very impressive Mountain West tournament title run, which was under the dress of the flu, I'm told from sources, close to sources, wow. close to sources. So, yes, Donovan Dent was riddled with the flu, still battled through it. House was awesome. Dutcher is like, we had no chance of stopping him pick and roll. I mean, I don't think, how is Clemson going to stop Jalen House and Donovan Denton pick and roll if San Diego State couldn't? That's my concern with Clemson. Their guards are not quick enough to keep up with New Mexico's guards. Yeah, again, Mexico's favored. Tells you how the committee did here. The 11's favored of the six. Clemson slightly overseeded. New Mexico definitely underseeded. Common opponent alert. Common opponent alert. Clemson beat Boise by 17. And Little John, New Mexico was 1-2 and two against Boise this season. I think Boise won at, at New Mexico also. This is the first Power 6 opponent New Mexico's played all year, like we said with Utah State. However, the Dent-Mashburn-House factor gets me going for New Mexico, man. They don't make mistakes. All three of them can create. All three can score. On the other end, I think Toppin's a pretty good matchup for Schieflin. Nelly Jr. Joseph maybe put some sort of fight up for P.J. Hall or whoever you want to do that matchup. Switch them if you want. Clemson has tons of size, but the backcourt edge is staunchy with the Lobos with respect to uh, Hunter and Gerard uh, Lobos for me. Yeah. I'm Clemson Island here, guys. I I'm fading a mountain West team. I'm back in a, a tiger team. That's super, super experienced has done a lot of good work away from home. One at UNC, one at Alabama, <clears throat> uh, one at Pitt. Like they, they've, they've been good outside of little John. Uh, the stat for me here, post-up defense in New Mexico has played a ton of really good post-up threats. Ladi, Asabor, all through that mountain West gauntlet. 303rd in efficiency defending post-ups. Clemson is second nationally in post-up rate, just between Gonzaga and Purdue, and they score at the 18th most efficient rate in the country. P.J. Hall is tremendous down there. Uh, I think they're going to get a lot of buckets inside, start forcing rotations. This could be an efficiency over type of game because of both teams having routes to scoring. Uh, I think Clemson gets the, the inside domination. On the other end, I, I, I hope and assume they're going to play some drop stuff and force – those very good New Mexico guards to pull up in the mid range and, and knock down those jumpers, which they've been middling at so far this year, 217th nationally in, in field goal percentage on mid range jumpers. That's it, Matt. I'm going Clemson here against the grain. I know how popular the New Mexico pick is, but uh, give me the Tigers. Yeah. I think you're just betting on execution, Jim and general team intelligence for New Mexico has fallen short so many times in some big moments. Now their talent is so overwhelming that it hasn't mattered in many other moments. And I am betting on the, yeah, this is a Jimmy and Joe bet for sure. This is a Jimmy and Joe bet, not next no bet. So we'll see. I, I should tally and chart bifurcate those, those bets and see how they do this year. This is definitely a Jimmy and Joe bet. I think that's uh, a lot bias. of shade on the Jimmy's and Joe's on Clemson. They got some good players, man. Oh yeah. I, I, I agree. I, I think the front line of New Mexico is what people don't realize is really terrifyingly talented too. I think that's going to pop against Clemson JTT and, uh, and NJJ. All right. Nothing more on that one. I'll stop talking about my Lobos guy. Let's talk Baylor Colgate, the bears kind of a popular pick to come out of the region of drama as Sean Rossing has so eloquently described it. Um, the Bears are short on depth, but will it matter against Colgate, who we've already kind of posited as not a great version of a typical Colgate team? Here's my two cents. I don't like that Baylor's games are so high variance. They shoot a ton of threes. They allow a ton of threes. At the pace they play, slower, not great against Colgate, who can get hot. As, as down as we think they are, they, they can't get hot from three. I think Baylor waxes them uh, against opponents outside of the top 100. Only one, that was Oklahoma State. Played within 13 points against Baylor this year. Most got blown out. Colgate did compete at Syracuse, but they always do. They lost to Illinois by 17. So those are their, their power opponents for Colgate. They're smart. They're experienced. They have a solid point guard. It's not the same caliber team. Matt mentioned it. Colgate that we're used to the last couple of years. They should have lost to Bucknell in the Patriot Tourney. They do compete on the glass. Their front court is their strength. I'm just not sure they can guard Baylor's backcourt. And the athleticism edge is stark. Here, I think it's it's Baylor for me. Well, I know it's Baylor for me, Jim, in this matchup. Yeah, I really like Baylor. This is, again, another one like Vermont I, almost every year. It's like Colgate and Vermont keep it close for a little while, and then it's the athleticism overwhelms. So perhaps, like, uh, you know, it, it'll be close at halftime. You look up, you're worried about Baylor, and, and then, then it's not end up being the case. This, this Colgate team was awesome in Patriot play because they crushed people inside. They had the best post duo by far 
they, they go Woodward and records one, two punch. They don't start them together anymore. Woodward and the whole team like asked for him to come off the bench after early in the year he was starting and they just didn't like the way it was working. But like Eves Misi is a lottery pick. Uh, Ojun Wuna is also huge. They've got the bodies to con- combat Colgate inside and the wing athleticism is just completely overwhelmingly in, in Baylor's favor. Uh, they're not going to press the way Arkansas did to overwhelm Colgate and some of these teams have done against them, but the shot making, the the off the bounce athleticism, uh, I think is going to be a real problem for Colgate, Matt. And they've had a lot of really good shooting luck so far this year, both three point and free throw. And Baylor's not going to give you shooting luck; they're too good. I agree. Uh, Langston Love, you got to check on. I don't, I'm not sure if he's going to play. I, he's a pretty huge piece. I don't yeah, care. It, it, okay, I care. I think he's very important. Uh, I think he remember, for the second round. I don't think he matters for this game. I right. I think he matters deeper as we go. But he w- he got injured, I believe, in the first round game last year. UC Santa Barbara did not play. Baylor fans will tell you he was a big reason they did not advance beyond. So I think just a storyline to watch if you're looking to pick Baylor in your bracket. Uh, which I was wanting to go final four. I, I was kind of, we'll get to there. I'm kind of on the fence though. Well, you, mean, um, he's never played. you mean Creighton, he never right? Plays. He's always they, hurt. It sucks. They smashed Babs. They, they lost to Creighton. Yeah, he didn't yeah, play. He in, yeah, he got hurt in the yeah. UC Santa Barbara game yeah. and yeah, they got smashed by Creighton. Yeah. Um, all right, Dayton, Nevada, 7-10. You boys spent an afternoon in the uh, Dayton Flyer. Lovely, uh, lovely arena. Lovely, lovely people. Great arena as so I'm um, uh, so, so told. What What's your breakdown here, Jim? Mm. Here is the uh, one of the weird kind of travel spots here. Games in Salt Lake City in altitude. Obviously, we've talked about why the Mountain West teams are potentially overvalued, over predicted, plopped or sorry, propped up by some uh, winning at home where many teams are not as accustomed to. Does Nevada sort of sustain that edge? Luckily, here with the draw playing in altitude, much closer to home than Dayton coming cross country. I, yeah, I think that could be an advantage for them, but I'm still going to continue my my rhetoric of anti Mountain West here. Uh, th- this should be a slow game. Like Dayton wants to play in the half court. Nevada has been very willing to play half court games, and that really helps Dayton with their lack of depth at altitude. If that wasn't the case, if this was somebody that was going to try to run them out of the gym, I think Dayton could wear down. Uh, but that that's not really Nevada's mo. Steve Alford also historically not a good tournament coach. Remember they got absolutely curb stomped by Arizona State last year. He lost in the first round to Harvard as three seed New Mexico back in the day. I just don't really trust him in this setting. And Dayton's got the best player on the floor and Deron Holmes, who can anybody not name KJ Himes, he's going to overwhelm. Probably get Nick Davidson in foul trouble. Um, Kai, I like Dayton here. I think they can get enough threes off over the top of Nevada's defense. Give me the Flyers. Yeah, I point out, I don't want to get like geography nerd here. While Salt Lake is elevated, it's not as high altitude as a lot of the other places in, in the Mountain West. So it's around 4,000 something feet. It's not like the highest out there. So I, I still think actually, there's yeah, a... Bill Self actually made the exact point. He's like, I think yes. people over, overhype the altitude thing. It's actually just a partial thing, not and, a full altitude. In fact, Salt Lake has hosted the most tournament games in the country besides, um, I want to say Indianapolis. So we 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 have a strong sample size of Salt Lake games. I don't think it's going to be a problem for Dayton. Um, now they have no wins against an at-large opponent. That's pretty crazy, Dayton. Uh, but beating St. John's in neutral, beating Cincy at a semi-away venue, competing with both Houston on a neutral and at Northwestern are very impressive. St. John's would be favored over basically every team seated six or lower in this field. Cincinnati would be favored over several six, seven, eight, and nine seeds. Those aren't bad wins. Uh, they are their tournament caliber wins. Dayton's, uh, Dayton has an All-American, obviously, with Deron Holmes. He's a matchup nightmare against Nevada. However, Matt and Jim, Nevada's backcourt and wing size, could that cause problems for Kobe Ellis, Javon Bennett, Enoch Cheeks, guys that aren't very big but are skilled? Hopefully, Dayton, the way they can shoot the crap out of the ball, top 33-point attempt rate, number three three-point percentage is the difference here. I like Dayton as well. I, I do think they pick on Bennett. I think that's a valid point. Yep. Like either Lucas shooting over the top of him or Blackshear posting him up. That's that's a very good call. Uh, I like Nevada here. I do. I just don't trust Dayton's guards right now. Um, they shot the crap out of the ball, but I think you just saw last game against Duquesne in the tournament. They don't make shots and they rely too much on the three Dayton. They don't go to their bread and butter and site consistently when everyone's basically draped on Jerron Holmes. Um, I think there's some variance downside there. And I just think that is more balanced, a little more stable. Um, and again, I think that location thing will help them relative to the other Mountain West teams. 
Uh, let's hit Arizona Long Beach State. Great story with the beach. Dan Monson um, sort of walking the plank of job security. Well, he's basically been fired, but still coaching. As long as he continues to win, don't think he's going to beat Arizona round one, Jimbo. But we have seen Long Beach run with some power conference teams playing high possession games, not afraid to to dial it up. UCLA in years past this year as well. The talent's there. They haven't been healthy. That's why they're underseeded, I would say, the beats. They're probably, you know, I think they're better like a 14, 13 seed caliber, but the resume doesn't quite get there because of the losses they took. I get that. But um, I think it's not a pushover for Arizona. No, no. And, and Arizona has not covered a game under Tommy Lloyd. Like they've had some issues, mm -hmm. uh, even in what seemed to be some favorable matchups in the past transition based game against TCU a couple of years ago. And they, weren't able to to separate probably should have lost that game in the second round if not for a semi-controversial call right at the end of regulation um this team's a little bit different it's not super too big based like Ballo and Tubelis were two guys that you know kind of had the inner interplay high low type stuff Keisha Johnson's a lot more versatile but Kylan Boswell sometimes vanishes from games uh, Caleb Love is mega inconsistent and yeah, the, the beach is talented and athletic. This isn't they a are. team that's going to get completely outclassed in that department. Um, I'm just worried, Kai, they're going to play too fast and, and let Arizona have the transition opportunities that make them so great. They're not going to slow it down the way Princeton did, and that's that's the death knell for me. Plus, Tohonis, Tohonis being banged up, his groin is, is very balky right now. Yeah, when Arizona's at its best, there's maybe no one better in the country. Uh, UConn, obviously right there, Kentucky, Top Gear, whatever. Yeah, I hope Lloyd gets the monkey off his back because he's a good coach, in my opinion, a good guy and everything like that. Now, Arizona lost to Oregon State and Stanford. We know that. But here are some other results against teams around Long Beach State's caliber. They beat Arizona State by 18 and by 45. They beat Cal by 26 and 19. They beat Colgate by 27. They beat Arlington by 45. They beat Belmont by 32. Beach has athletes, but they cannot shoot a lick. They don't shoot threes. They can't shoot threes. That's a killer against Arizona. I think they're. I think the Cats score inside at will. They control the glass. It, it's Arizona. Yeah, that, that's like the two-sided double-edged sword way you break down all these matchups. Like I think Long Beach has talent. Has you know they don't they look like a power conference team in terms of the speed and the athleticism. But that's if you don't pose anything different or unique or challenging to Arizona. The UT Arlington game. I was vividly remember in my car <laughs> right <laughs> uta was up seven points late in the first half and i look back at my phone and i'm like they're down 30 they were just up seven and like it happened within eight minutes and it was just like the blink of an eye and that's what arizona can do with their depth and their speed in the open court and the size ah gut tells me that's where this game ultimately goes but uh whatever happens mr monson it's been a great run it's been a, one of the all-time fun mid-major darlings casper Ware, all the greats to come after you uh we wish gonzaga you started the gonzaga train and the Gonzaga that? train, yes. Uh, some yeah, fun family funny. reunion there, I believe, with uh, Matson and Rice and a few. Oh, good yeah, point. Yeah, 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 would yeah. For anybody uh, that thinks you were joking about the Arlington thing, Arizona won in a fifty to seven run. Fifty to fifty two seven. Yeah, they're good. Yes, they're good. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. My gosh. Mm. Yeah, thirty three four to open the half. Uh, that'll do it. Well, let's talk round of thirty two. Yeah, picks How cute are we in this get? region. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kai, go to you first. All right, Sweet 16. Uh, UNC and Alabama, New Mexico and Arizona. I'm kind of worried my theme is trusting offensive teams, but that's how I'm going, I guess, in this region. So you went Lobos over Baylor? I didn't even go. I I'm didn't going Lobos wow. over Baylor. Lobo went Baylor. I don't know why, but I'm doing it. Uh, Alabama <laughs> versus Arizona in the Elite Eight. Arizona's making the Final Four redemption tour for Tommy Lloyd. Had a baby. Uh, North Carolina, Alabama as well for me. I wanted to get there on St. Mary's, but uh, I don't know. They, they could they could do it. They could slow down Alabama. I'm, I'm intrigued if we get that game. Uh, Baylor and Arizona on the bottom for me, and then Baylor over Carolina in the Elite Eight Matthias rematch of the 2022 Sweet 16 game. Redemption mm. for the Bears. They are headed back to the Final Four under Scott Drew, although there's you know, the stupid Louisville talks. Don't go to Louisville, Scott Drew. Please don't. They offered him an obscene amount of money. A lot of money down in Louisville. <laughs> um, Your picks, man. Uh, I was going to make a last-second change again because I don't like my picks. <laughs> I have Mississippi State being North Carolina. I'm very on Chris Chans and, and what this team, as terms of bracket, a bracket buster, Kai. I have St. Mary's 
getting there as well. So I have Charleston beating Alabama as sort of my really man, I went that far upset. St. Mary's beating Charleston and then Mississippi State beating Santa. So Mississippi State in the Elite Eight okay. playing Baylor. And I did take Baylor to go final four. Um Baylor beating Arizona. And now I'm kind of wanting to come along with my guy Kai on New Mexico. I I don't know if I can look myself in the mirror after beating the, the Lobo drum all year and then picking yeah. him to go out in the round of I'm gonna make that change right now. I Done. just got so kind of New Mexico. It, I don't know. I got cute with it. So no, you don't have Baylor take, going to the final. Take this four. No, I don't. I so an amended projection here: Arizona beats New Mexico, and Arizona beats Mississippi State, and all the Tommy Lloyd hate um, is extinguished. I basically pick what I want to happen. I want Arizona in the final four. <laughs> I want Purdue in the final four. I want Houston in the final four. Um, that's what I picked to happen. Uh, a good lead in the final four and title fix, picks, fellas. If you if you want to, Jim, I don't know if you want to lead that as general host. Kai, I'd love to. Uh, yeah, final four, as a reminder, was Illinois, Baylor, Houston, and Purdue. And I'm going with Houston over Baylor in an all-Texas Big 12 showdown in the title game. Uh, the game at Baylor was wonderful. Uh, <clears throat> thankfully, if that's the title game, Kai, we won't have to watch it at the Baylor Arena with that <clears throat> redonkulous camera view. This will actually be uh, – it'll be in an NFL stadium, but uh, still better. So have you seen Houston, the court? the win over Baylor. No, I haven't. court looks very cool. Very cool. I'm excited nice. about it. All right. Good, 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 good. Yep. Uh, my final four was Auburn, Houston, Arizona, and Purdue. I'm taking Purdue over Arizona in the title game. Redemption tour. That's the new formula. 16 over one. Next year, one wins the title. I think it happens again, Matt. It happens again. That'd be that'd be a fun rematch. That neutral site game was Purdue, Boston, Arizona. Yes. In Indy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was my backup final. I have FAU Arizona in a rematch. Final four. Arizona um it's not this winning. One. F- no, FAU, FAU wins again. I have FAU losing to Houston in the title game. Houston beats Purdue. So I have chalk on the right and fun on the left. That's kind of the two-faced approach of my bracket. The left regions, the drama region, the gladiator region, lots of fun over there. The right, I went kind of by the book, chalky, boring, uh, hoping to salvage some bracket success. As our reputations, unfortunately hinge too much on how well we do in our families' pools and how we assist and advise other friends and families. So I got to at least uphold some sort of... Uh, no, I suck at brackets, there. and I tell everybody that immediately. I will finish last. Who cares? It's all about your heart, man. Throw all the nonsense we just talked about at the window. Great advice. And pick what you want. FAU to the finals? I tell you what, man. That'd be a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking, of, speaking of fun, I, the people that are like, I, I know like John Fendler does a good video on bracket strategy and stuff. Like if you're entering a bracket pool, like how do I maximize plus EV? Like you're, I don't like that. Have fun. Like Kai said, pick some fun stuff. Well, the right answer is to pick chalk. That's the answer. Yeah. For the most part. We, we need yeah. to be in, really... in smaller, in smaller groups. If you're in a huge bracket pool, like ESPN's like million stuff, you got to go yeah. crazy. You got to up the variance. Yeah, you but have like the probability. Type yeah. Stuff. In your office pool, though, go chalk if you want to win the, the 20 person pool for sure. I agree with Pat's take, though. We, given the level of cerebral horsepower that we have in this this group, we should be call cut it, guys. I think that's the graduation. I love cut is yeah, awesome. We, yeah, we my, need to bring that into Al the mainstream. Talks of, to me about of his cut cut all yeah. the time. And I need to get in on it next year. That's a 2025 initiative for the week, Kai. Um, on Should the, we make our own uh, on, Calcutta on, on League? That'd plan. be kind of fun, actually. That's that's a next year thing. If not, no, not this year. Next year. Yeah. Let's make that more mainstream. Hey, fun. can we get some likes before on the way out? Golly. Golly, gang. Oh, well, Gee, sure. I usually, I have not liked this episode yet. Yeah, so let's get some so. likes. This okay. was uh, Jim. We're at two hours and 12 minutes. Honestly, on the, on the quicker side for our marathon podcasts every year. Yeah, kept glancing at the, the clock. I was like, yeah, we're, we're cooking through this. We did a nice job. Skipping through Roots Roundup certainly helps. Uh, yeah, hopefully this helped you for your long flight out to Vegas, wherever you're going from, if that's where you're listening. Or if you're just at home getting ready to watch the games on Thursday, Friday, uh, maybe you do the exact opposite of everything we said and do well in your pool. That That's an option as well. Thank you for tuning in. Again, if you're, if you're listening before Tuesday, we will have our best bet shows. 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. going through Thursday games first, then Friday games. There will be separate iterations, separate shows. Those will also live on our YouTube channel. If you miss the live version, they will still be out there if you want to check them out. We'll have our breakdowns but from a much more strict gambling lens through every single game. So feel free to check that out as well. Boy, that's it. That's the Marathon Podcast this year. We are, we are always happy to do it. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you later.